That's number 871. This is uh, Charlie Hunnam, who, of course, uh, you may know as Jax from Sons of Anarchy. Uh, but he is also a delightful individual who is so open and warm. And it just if, – if you looked at Charlie Hunnam or his performances and you're like, hey, I think I might uh, have a crush on that guy – then I challenge you, and but if you didn't, if you didn't do that, then I challenge you to listen to him talk as a person, and then not have a crush on him by the time you're done. He's a lovely human being. Uh, he's promoting King Arthur: Legend of the Sword out this Friday, May twelfth. This was the Talking with Chris Hardwick episode uh, from last Sunday. This is the extended version on the Nerdist podcast. Um, and then uh, Jordan Peele is the next guest. That's Sunday, May fourteenth on AMC at eleven ten Central. And then, of course, the podcast or the extended version will be on the following week. I know Jordan was just on at the podcast, but uh, it's still worth a listen. Still worth a listen next week. But right now, this is Charlie Hunnam uh, promoting King Arthur Legend of the Sword, Friday, May 12th, on the Nerds Podcast. Katie, please roll the talking with Chris Hardwick thing. Now entering Nerdist.com. My guest tonight burst onto the scene as Nathan Maloney in the British version of Queer as Folk goofed around as a college student and Judd Apatow's Undeclared was a pivotal plot point in the Civil War love story Cold Mountain and stormed our shores piloting Jaegers and stomping Kaiju in the blockbuster Pacific Rim. And I think we could probably 100% agree that his role as Jax, the hamlet of biker gangs in the critically acclaimed series Sons of Anarchy, made us all stand up from our couches and go, Oh my God, I love this guy. I love you so much. Charlie, I love you so much. Tonight, we're going to fight. Some of you probably did that, for real. Tonight, we're going to find out more about his life and career, as well as his starring role in Guy Ritchie's King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. Spoiler alert, he is King Arthur. That is right, friends. Tonight, the incredible Charlie Hunnam will be talking with Chris Hardwick. All right, we have heard from you on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, using at talking. So I'm going to read your questions, comments, some comments even showing video messages you sent in for Charlie. And folks in the studio audience, Comic-Con style, will get to stand up and ask their questions. But uh, I'm going to start the chat a little bit first. Please welcome Charlie Hunnam. Thank you for being here, Charlie. Charlie's, uh, you were very gracious and came on the Nerdist podcast maybe, I don't know, it was like three or four years ago. Yeah, and maybe even five. Could have been as long as five years ago. And it was one of those ones where, you know, every once in a while, one will just really resonate with people. And then for the re- forever, people are like, oh, I really love that one with, and you were one of those ones. That's people cool. re- really love the chat. Yeah, I was saying, people have brought that up to me since, too, you know, it sounds like you have a big following and well i do too you have a big so following with yeah. those followings matt and we made podcast love well yes. we did make sweet podcast love <laughs> oh my god half the audience just got pregnant <laughs> but i i think it you know i don't see you do a lot of long form stuff so i think it was mm-hmm. one of those things of like oh i don't really know anything about charlie and you had so much great stuff to talk about and we're going to cover a lot of it tonight but i want to start with king arthur uh, because I, my wife and I watched it the other night, and it's fantastic. Uh, Guy Ritchie directed King Arthur, and he, of course, is King Arthur, and it's just a really great take on it. It's epic, but it moves, and it has the kind of the Guy Ritchie filter to it. Um, but you guys shot that in the U.K. Had you been back for a while? No, I'd, uh, I'd been doing Sons of Anarchy for... We shot it seven seasons over the course of eight years, and so I had been trying to also nourish a film career at the right. same time. So I would shoot the show for six months and then try to do a film in, in my off time. And so that had been keeping me really, really busy. And I had actually been talking to my girlfriend, really coveting, you know, going and spending a good piece of time and reconnecting with the rhythm of life in England. So yeah. my girlfriend and I had actually talked about maybe going to rent a house once the show finished and uh, once Sun's finished and we were going to go to London, maybe get a house for six months and just see what life felt like. And then halfway through the last season of Sons, I, uh, I got King Arthur. So that took me there for seven months anyway. So oh, wow. it was great. Uh, I did that film and then I did another film called The Lost City of Zed right after, right. which also um, we shot in the UK, uh, at least half of it. So I ended up being there for about 10 months. So you're from Newcastle? Yes. Although. Did, you, did, you, did you get to spend time there? 
No, I didn't. You know, I, most of my family live down south now, and so I used to go up and visit my dad in Newcastle a lot, but, but he's not there anymore. So, um, but we, we shot up in, um, up in uh, the Highlands of Scotland, which okay. is an area that I spent a lot of time in my youth and one of my favorite places in the world. If you've never been up to there, I would really recommend it's, it. It's really stunning. I mean, it's just the greenest green you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. And the night sky is, it just, it's like, it's like a chandelier hanging down. There's so many stars in the sky. Right. Is that, were you going to end up there someday, you think, maybe just move out to the highlands? I mean, every time I'm up there, I have that fantasy of just going up and, you know, disconnecting from life and yeah. living, you know, a little bit more quiet, peaceful life. But I got a few more things I want to do before all You're of that. You're still very young. It's still, you still have plenty of time before you need to think about going away anywhere. I mean, there's rumors that you have a ranch outside of Los Angeles somewhere? Is that, yeah, is, uh-uh. that that's not, is that true? No, I got a big mouth. I was doing, um, <laughs> I was doing a lot of press. I think for Sons, at a time that I was deciding that I was going to go and buy a ranch, and okay. I put in an offer, and uh, the offer got accepted. It was actually pretty close to L.A., about an hour outside of town. And it was maybe... I think it was maybe like eight and a half, nine acres, something like that, with a bunch of chickens and some uh, donkeys that we were going to inherit and a horse and an acre of um, organic vegetable garden, which basically it was just my paradise, what I've been dreaming of for years. But I had 18 months of work lined up straight. Got it. King Arthur being one of them, Lost City of Zed, and then another film that I was scheduled to do that I didn't end up actually going to do to shoot. It fell through. But I realized I was just going to buy this ranch, move my girlfriend there, and then leave for 18 months. <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, leave her with the chickens and the, the donkeys. Chickens, yeah, which seemed like I got enormous. you some friends. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> exactly. So I realized that, you know, timing's everything. And... But at that time, it wasn't right. So, so what? So, just if you don't mind going back a little bit and talking about England and growing up, um, what is what is Tiny Charlie Hunnam like? What are you like as a kid? Like, what do you what do you want to do? What do you think you can do when you when you're in England? What do your parents do? You know, I grew up in 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 Newcastle, like you said, which is was a big, important city in the Industrial Revolution. So it's a very beautiful city that when, as it was growing, there was a lot of money being generated in that part of the world. There was shipbuilding, uh, coal mining, a lot of factory work. And then towards the middle of the century, a lot of those industries dried up and the area fell into a period of economic decline. And so when I was growing up there, it was pretty poor. And people were really just going through the motions, trying to survive. And I felt like I was just a weird kid and, you know, <laughs> grown into a pretty weird adult. Um, but <laughs> it's a true story. Uh, <laughs> but I just remember one of my earliest and most powerful sort of like original thoughts that I had. There's something that hadn't come across, you know, from my you know, conversations I'd overheard with teachers or, or parents or anything. I, I started to get sort of fixated with this idea that people weren't, they were, they were just engaged in the rhythm of life, whether it was like social or environmental responsibilities, being parents or husbands or wives or, you know, that, that life itself was dictating the rhythm of their life. And they there was a lot of people I felt like sort of stuck in that and weren't able to bring forth their intention for what they wanted their life to be. Right. And I mean, I'm talking young. I was thinking about this at f- five and six, you know, oh, wow. just sort of aware that people weren't really happy. And I decided then I sort of begged the question, like, what do I want to do with my life and what is my intention? And I was always really, really involved, uh, you know, interested in film and involved myself in sort of amateur performing arts and stuff. And so that just became this fixation for me from a very young age that I wanted to get out of that part of the world and go and spend my life working in film. Did you tell your parents this? Were they supportive? I did. I mean, I did. I was always very vocal about it. I remember it actually sort of felt like full circle when I got King Arthur because Excalibur, John Borman's film Excalibur, was a very instrumental and important film in my childhood. And I'd watch it over and over again. I remember having conversations with my mom when I was probably maybe six, seven, eight, something like that, and asking her what, what are the logistics of filmmaking in terms of 
I was watching these people, you know, doing this heroic stuff, sword fighting and riding horses and, you know, kissing the pretty girl at the end of the film and all of that. And I said, I was like, interested in how that would come together. So I asked my mom, what do they do? Do they go out and look for an actor that knows how, that has that skill set, that knows how to sword fight, knows how to ride horses and kiss pretty girls? And she <laughs> said, um, no, I don't think so. I think you probably, like, hire somebody who has the spirit and the, you know, the, the look and the energy of, of, of what they're looking for in that character and then teach them those skills. Uh-huh. And obviously, as a seven-year-old kid, that just blew my mind that you could <laughs> be your job learning how to sword fight and ride horses and stuff. So that was... Um, it, was, it felt sort of kismet and like a full circle when I actually ended up getting the role of King Arthur, you know, because that, that role had been one of the big genesis moments of consolidating this dream that I had of being an actor. Was Guy Ritchie, was he familiar with your work at all, or did they have you? In- yes, <laughs> unfortunately he was. <laughs> <laughs> he had only seen one film that I had done, and he really wasn't a fan of it at all. <laughs> oh, wow. And, and nor the work that I had done in it. And so it was funny. I had, I have a bunch of people in common with uh, Guy. Uh, like my manager, for instance, used to represent Guy for years. And so there'd been this connective tissue between us. I'd had a lot of people saying, telling me over the years, like, you know Guy Ritchie? And I would say, no. He said, oh, you kind of remind me of him. Like, the, you guys are cut from the same cloth, you know, two peas in a pod. And so I felt this sort of connection to him. And I'd all, I've obviously, as, as we all are, I'm a huge fan of his work and had been for years. And so I felt this sort of connection to him. And I just assumed that whenever we met or when our paths inevitably crossed, we were going to be, be... It was going to be magic. Yeah, we were going to be pals. It was going to be magic and everything was going to be great. And then, um, and then King Arthur came along and I thought King Arthur, one of my favorite stories and this big instrument uh, thing in my childhood, this, this, this important movie in my, fil- in, in my childhood. And, uh, and Guy Ritchie, it just seemed like a match made in heaven. And so my manager, who knows him very well, reached out and said, what do you think about that? And he said, yeah, I think that's a terrible idea. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm not interested at all. And she said, why? And he told her that he'd seen this film and he didn't think I was very good in it. And... Uh, <laughs> And so this is all my whole, uh, this whole thing that I built up, this fantasy of, of, our, uh, of our, you know, first meeting has just crumbling. And it really hurt my feelings. Oh, no, and so no. it did. I'm not just working the... These ladies will beat you. the shit out of Guy no, Ritchie for you. No, it ends well. He's a lovely man. Okay, good. So I decided it was, this was happening and on the, while we were shooting the last season of Sons of Anarchy and the, we had a hiatus for a week in the middle, right at the time that he was going to meet actors. And so I said, you know what? I'm just going to get on a plane and I'm going to go to England and I haven't seen my mum for a while. So it'll be nice. I'll go see my family and just get me in a room with him because I just want an hour to have a cup of tea so we can see who I am because yes. I just felt I felt it was reductive. He just sort of dismissed me and I said, I'm not having it. So, <laughs> I, uh, so, so you I fatal attraction him. Yeah, I fatal yeah. attraction him. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so we got uh, we, we went I got there and we um, we sat down in his living room and ended up having a one hour long conversation about California medical marijuana. Oh, wow. And uh, which I know nothing about. (laughs) He lied. Um, So uh, so uh, that sort of cemented our friendship and we liked each other. And uh, and then before we knew it, he'd asked me to come in and audition, stay a couple of extra days. So I I did uh, some auditions and he ended up giving me the role. So I'm glad that I took the initiative and got on the plane and went. What do you think it was that I mean, what is it about? Because not everyone would think to do that, you know? I mean, this business, which, 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 which there's so much rejection and there's so much stonewalling and mm. you never know why you don't get stuff sometimes, you know, it's like, you know, but something in your brain said, no, I really feel like if I can just get in front of them, it's going to work. So what made you do You know do what? That? Honestly, I didn't think that. I, I thought that the, I, I, I thought that um, ultimately I wasn't going to get the role. I just felt, I just had concocted this scenario in my mind that we were going to, like, love each other and be, like, pals at some point. <laughs> and then he just completely brushed that aside. And my feelings were hurt. And I just said, you know what? This is bullshit. I know yeah. he's going to like me. I'm a very charming guy, you know? So <laughs> I said, uh, I'm just going to get on a plane. And, and it wasn't really with the intention of thinking that I was going to secure the role. I just thought I would, you know make him like me and we might become <laughs> pals you know so well you know with uh with sons of anarchy you know that that's that's a show that's a 
And Jax is a career-defining role. I mean, like, I know you had done a lot of... Thank you. And, I, you know, I know you had worked a ton up until that, but is that when you really felt things start to click? And at any point, did that role feel constrictive to you because you're like, shit, I don't want to be this guy forever. I want to go on and do other things. I mean, what was the push and pull? Uh, well, the initial reaction that I had was... Uh, was that it was a profoundly positive and exciting thing, obviously. And, and that was really my, my relationship with it all the way through. But it did come at a time that was very important for me to get something sure. that I could sink my teeth into. I'd been struggling. We talked about it, on, I think, what, last time we spoke. But I'd been really struggling in my career in that I had a clear idea of the type of movies I wanted to be doing and the directors that I wanted to be working with. And I was being very exacting in my pursuit of that, you know, right. sort of non, um, you know, malleable in what I was really considering. Um, but it was really difficult, and I was spending enormous periods of time unemployed. I mean, I spent two and a half years once where I didn't make a single penny, didn't do a day's, an hour's work on a set. I had another period of two years and another period of 18 months, so you add all those up together, and they were consecutive. I did one film in between each of those periods mm-hmm. of unemployment, and I just felt like... You know, it, I, I'm certainly not saying that it's like, you know, woe is me and the life of an actor is hard because there's people out there that are really struggling. Sure. But it, within the context of that, of the profession, it does have some severe, some, some significant challenges. And so I had found myself just endlessly waiting for the phone to ring for, you know, literally week after week, going into months and sometimes years. And I just thought, what am I doing with my life? And I would get really close to, you know, to a, a project with an actor, I was, with a director I was really excited about and a script that I thought was wonderful. And the director would, I had a few of these instances in a row where the director would fall in love with me and say, he's my guy, but I didn't have any cachet with the financiers sure. or the studios and I, wouldn't, I didn't end up getting the role because of it. So I, right before I got Sons, I had had this idea of a script that I wanted to write about Vlad the Impaler yes. that we discussed on Nerdist at great length. And I just felt like I had to do something to take some control over my career and get, you know, and have a purpose of specific linear purpose every day when I woke up in the morning. So I had about, I just finished doing a movie and I had about 18 months worth of money in the bank. I knew if I just ate rice and tuna, (laughs) cans of tuna, I could survive for 18 months. And I sat down and said, I'm not going to read another script. I'm not going to be an actor for 18 months. I'm going to sit down and take this time and write a script and do something that's creatively fulfilling and that like, you know, try to have tried to uh, approach it from a different angle and create some sense of control. So I wrote that script and ended up managing to sell it and came out of that period and said, OK, now I better return to being an actor and see what, what's what. And the first script I read after that hiatus was, um, was Sons of Anarchy. And it was really because I had a big... I hadn't read a script in 18 months, but I had a fairly <laughs> large pile of scripts to read, and I was sort of reluctantly, you know, sort of circling this, my desk with this big, big pile. And Sons of Anarchy, because it's a TV script, was way thinner than any of the other scripts. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll, I'll start with that one and I read it and was just blown away and said man I'll do anything to you know get me in a room with these guys I want to try to get this role you know it's so I I find as many in the like almost 900 podcast episodes I've I've done is, is talking to people and finding out what you just said which is you know when people kind of abandon trying to be something to everyone else and focus on the thing that they care about or like what's creatively fulfilling to them just so, and I'm not a mystical person anyway, but something in the universe changes. Yeah. And it's almost like other entities recognize that and are kind of drawn to you. And maybe it's because you exude a sense of like, oh, I, I know what I want. And that's attractive in some way. Do you have a, do you have a take on that? I do. Uh, twofold. I mean, I, there's, there's an amazing uh, Henry David Thoreau quote that I've always loved from Walden. Um, Thoreau is a man who decided to go and try to figure out what the meaning of life was, and he went to... Um, he segregated himself from society and went and lived in a cabin on Walden Lake yeah. and wrote this incredible dissertation about on his, on his theory of the meaning of life from what he'd learned from this period. 
But there's a, there's a quote from that book that, I, that always really resonated, where he said, I have learned this at least by my experiment, that if one advances confidently in the direction of their dreams and endeavors to live the life that they have imagined, they will meet with success, unexpected in common hours. And that idea of the unexpected in common hours, I thought always really has, has struck me, as, as, has got a, a great amount of truth to it, because... The, in the, other, the other thing that I, I read an interesting book a while ago called, I think, The Seven Rings or The Five Rings, and it was about a samurai. And he talks a lot about the sacrifices that the samurai would make to their sword. Everything is about the relationship with their sword, and no sacrifice is too great to make to that sword because you make all of that sacrifice with the agreement that in the moments, whether it would be one second or three minutes every 10 years, you're going to need that sword to save your life. And it'll be there for you. And it'll be there for you. Right. And so um, I've often thought about that, that, you know, you you put in 40% effort, you get 40% results. You put in 80% effort, you get 80% results. But if you put 100% effort in, somehow the universe conspires to help you and you'll get 120% result, you know? And so... Um, none of that was particularly linear, what I just said. No, but no, it was but it all, all circling around but it the all, same it idea. All, it, all, it all makes sense uh, because it it does help explain. I mean, again, you know, everyone runs off in a million different directions. Oh my God! I'm, you know, if you're auditioning, oh, I want this person to like me, and this, oh, what, they didn't. Oh no, I got so close, you know, mm-hmm. or whatever it is that, that that people are pursuing. And there really is, you know, like when you just kind of let all that crap go. And just go, well, what do I want? You know, what makes, me, what makes me happy? Which is a question I think a lot of people don't really even know how to answer or even bother asking themselves. Yeah. But I think it is one of the single most important questions to be able to answer as a human. Right. Uh, and people just don't take the time to do it. And I've always been impressed with, because it really, it seems like you just work on stuff that you're interested in and cool stuff. And then when the whole Fifty Shades thing happened and they cash in Fifty Shades, like, oh, you know, Charlie's a good guy. That's going to be a big franchise. And then it all kind of went away, and then I, I, I don't know. I had, a lot of re- I had a lot of respect for, I don't know, it just like to kind of walk away from something like that that you knew was probably going to be a commercial success, but yeah. maybe just didn't feel right to you. Is that how it went down, or what was the... I mean, with that specifically, uh, there were many moving elements to that. Um, I was, I got myself in a position because I was emotionally in a bit of a wrought place that had a big thing happen in my life, my personal life, and it had thrown me for a spiral, you know? Um, And so I, well, I don't think I was thinking clearly. And I was in a great position in my career where for the first time I was getting offered tons of interesting stuff. And I've always... I've always felt very strongly just do one thing at a time and do it to the best of your ability. Um, and, and, but then all of a sudden, in the face of all of this opportunity that was coming my way, it was a little harder to practice what I was preaching. Sure. And I just took on too much and felt like not only... It takes an enormous amount of focus and energy to make a movie and be a significant part of that process. And I felt like... Everybody needs to give it their all to make sure this this collective, you know, process bears the fruits that you ha- you you would hope it to. And I just felt like I was spreading myself too thin. Um, and I'd already given my word to Guillermo del Toro, who, who was a friend of mine I'd worked with before, that I would star in this other movie. And that had been that had preceded um, um, the sun. I mean, the uh, Fifty Shades. So. It was very, uh, it was really quite unfortunate and quite stressful uh, because I accepted the role and they publicized it to, um, you know, pretty, pretty, um, you know, pretty robustly. And then all of a sudden uh, I realized that I wasn't going to be able to do it. So um, Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, a little bit. So it was, uh, it was a rather stressful period of my life. But um, you live and learn, as they say. Yeah, but I think, it's, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's a smart thing to be able to do to realize when you're spreading yourself too thin. Because, you know, especially with what we do, it's like, well, I don't know if I'm going to work again. You, you know, you, you work, you take work because you go, this is kind of, you, we gather these acorns. Right. If, if there are lean times, you want to appreciate the work that you get. So to, to kind of let something go because you feel like it's too much is, is, I mean, it's a good decision, but it's not a decision everyone would, would make. Right. Right. But I think also you, I think having, 
integrity and in being authentic and true to yourself, sort of circling sure. back to your initial um, conversation point, I think is essential, you know, because ultimately, you know, it's a hard business and ultimately it is a business and you use always a tendency um, or an emphasis put on one's momentum and um, cachet in the, in the business right. at large. And so uh, uh, something like that comes up and for sure... I think it was just a given. I don't think anybody had any doubt in their mind that it was going to come out and be an enormous financial success. But at the center of it, I, I had to question if, it was, if that was leading the motivation to say yes and be involved in that uh, as much as like a creative decision. I mean, I think you, you maybe dodged a little bit of a bullet. You know what? To be really, to be fair, you know, I, I got to, I got to. Uh, Let's just be honest. I, I, I don't know. I, I got to like um, and admire all of the people involved in that film because I was in, I was in it, and so I was in, interacting with these people. Had you already started rehearsals and everything, or was no? It? But there'd been a long gotcha. process of chemistry readings sure, sure, sure. and stuff, and so I got to know Dakota very well, and I got to know Sam, the director, um, very, very well, and, and got to really. Um, care about her as a, as a pal. And so, you know, it was, it was funny because I was just, I, I never wanted to have to have an opinion about it, so I never saw the films. So, you know, and any time anyone talks about it, I sort of just sure. tune it out a little bit because right, right, I had right. nothing but the regret for the way I, you know, for the difficulty that I had created for those people when yeah. I pulled out and, you know, and, and hope that it would be very successful for them. So. Well, listen, listen, you know, it's... And it's, I think it has been, right? It's I mean, been very, it made listen, an you know, enormous amount of there's money. There's nothing wrong with Twilight for MILFs. Like, there's nothing wrong with it. <laughs> it's a different, you know, everyone deserves a movie. Every audience deserves a movie. Every audience deserves a movie. Do you guys like the movie? <laughs> Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> but it allows you to make cool stuff like, you know, uh, like King Arthur or Lost City. You say Lost City of Zed, but we say Z here in the United States. But you mean, is it Z, is it Z here? Are they saying Lost City Z of Z here? I think they're saying Z. Lost City of Z yeah. here? I mean, you could make an argument that, you know, America speaks English, which was obviously created in England, so maybe yeah. Z should be the like, correct split way. As might yeah. be the correct pronunciation, yeah. but... yeah. I mean, I am no one to talk because I go to England now and people think I'm American. So. Really? Yeah. Now, okay, so that's kind of an interesting. That's an interesting question. Does that affect? I mean, your identity being this, you know, you're here and you're there. Do you, I? I know you identify as British, but do you identify as American at all? Like, what do you? Who do? When you go back, do you feel like a little bit of an outsider? I do a little bit, and it's so funny geographical identity because it doesn't really ultimately mean anything, right. but it is. People are incredibly passionate about their geographical identity and the identity of dialects, particularly in England, which is so small but has such heightened, very, very specific regional dialects everywhere, you know? So um, I had already sort of gone through a couple of uh, experiences of knowing, understanding how vilified you can be for, like, for surrendering a, a, a specific identity and sure. taking another one on because I had moved to um, from Newcastle to the Lake District, which is two very, very different dialects at a time when I was impressionable, young, and just wanted to fit in. I moved when I think I was about 13. It was very difficult to move, you know, 200 miles to go to a new school and a whole new friends and everything at that age. So one of the things that I think I did was one of the ways I tried to fit in was by uh, assimilating that accent. Oh, you know? wow. And, and then going home immediately, like, six months later, and all my old pals being like, oh, you're fucking talking different now, aren't you? <laughs> like, you're too good for us. And like, I was like, wow, people are really passionate about their regional identity. Yeah, yeah, there's now, a tremendous amount of... There is a tremendous amount of tribalism yeah. in, in a very small area, it seems like. Yeah. Because in America, I think we sort of... We kind of understand, like, well, America's very large, so, you know, the Midwest is this, and South is this, and Texas is its own thing, and then New York is this. Uh, but there, I mean, you know, you have a landmass about the size of California, but with that much specific subset genre cultural diversity. Right. 
So do you feel like that helped you in this business at all, in the assimilation process? Does that help you as an actor? I think so. I mean, it, it, would, it would seem so, right? Yeah. Um, like on the surface, just that like, thing of being able to, you know, pick up accents and, and, and all of that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure it did. I'm sure it did. It certainly made me fearless about coming out here when I was 18 alone. I mean, right. I didn't know anybody when I came to L.A. I just I was at college um, studying film and got an opportunity to start working as an actor. So I took this role in Queer as Folk that you had mentioned. Uh, and then once I finished that, I was sort of at a crossroads. I could go back to film school, but I realized I'd been at film school for about a year and realized I'd learned more on my first day on a real set than I had in, in 12 months of academic, um, you know, research right. of what filmmaking is. And so the practical application. And so I, I didn't know what to do, though. I finished uh, this, this TV show and was really literally about to go back and move back in with my mom and continue going to college. And I got a call from someone saying they'd seen the show, um, a manager from Los Angeles, that they'd seen the show and thought that I was good and, and wondered if I would like representation and like to come out here and, you know, go seek my fortune. So... I just came out at 18 by myself and, um, you know, I think had I not had that experience of having to completely reinvent myself and start over in my mid-teens, it might have been a bit more daunting to do that. I mean, I don't, I, we don't know each other that well, but I just have a sense that, I don't know, do you feel as confident as it seems you are? Like, it just seems like, Charlie seems like a guy you could just drop him in anything and he'll fucking figure it out. You know what I mean? Like, I could, I feel like I could drop you in the middle of the wilderness and you'd, you'd go, okay, yeah, okay, I got to use that snake as a ladder and I'll cut down that tree and I'll make a fire with my fists. Like, how, do, you, do, you, do you, does it, does the world feel like that to you? Do you feel no, like it the doesn't? Opposite. Really? <laughs> the absolute opposite. Yeah, I feel sort of, you know, like I've got my neuroses and my, um, you know, my things that I, you know, worry about and feel inadequate and, you know, like everybody else all, all the time. I mean, I'm here, I got very nervous about coming here. I was really? driving over and I, re I, hadn't sp I hadn't talked about the film or done any interviews. And this is sort of, you know, it's not a natural thing to be doing, sitting and talking in front of, you know, very lovely people, but none of you I know at all and having a conversation <laughs> like this. I mean, you do it day in, day out, but it takes a certain amount of focus and energy to do this. And I just came back from vacation where I'd been thinking about nothing. So I, I saw <laughs> <laughs> and nothing about what I was going to eat for lunch. And I while was I was in eating... King Arthur? What? Right. Yeah, no, it was a little bit like that. King I thought, Arthur. oh, my goodness. I'm going to actually have to go and string a sentence together here and try to maybe tell a couple of jokes. So... Oh, my God, yeah. Well, wait do you get into junket mode and then you have to oh, like, my goodness, answer the God. same five fucking questions <laughs> over and over and over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, but I definitely want to get some general questions from the audience because uh, this, is, this is partially why we're here. Oh, wow. This is Romanda Tidball on Twitter. Hi, Charlie. Would you play James Bond if you were offered the role? Um. <laughs> oh, this lady who has just decided to be your agent has said yes. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. I'm actually talking um, to somebody about a sort of a, a spy genre film um, set in America that we're very, very excited about. Um, I feel like Daniel Craig's doing a great job and whoever else. Yeah. That goes down to that that identity thing. I mean, I know I'm playing King Arthur, but you, you can almost get away with King Arthur easier than you can well, get away Well, it's not going to be like nine King Arthur movies. You never know. I guess there could you be. You never know. I guess there could be. <laughs> yeah, but it is, it is like, how do, you, how do you pull away from that kind of indelible, you know, because I, I would imagine you probably want to, there must be an allure of like, oh, it's such an iconic role, but at the same time, Mm. Do I want to do that for, you know, a decade? Right. Well, listen, they haven't asked me, so I don't need to worry about <laughs> it. Uh, this, it's My Life 87. What is your pet peeve? Um, I'm a total germaphobe, and so um, I really hate having to shake <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I wish you had told me that before I shook your hand when you got here. No, I listen. I initiated. Okay, uh, that's true. Because I understand that in some situations, it's you know, it's the thing to do. But yeah. uh, I was I was at a restaurant the other day um, eating some curry with bread. And it was, like, getting right in there with my hands. And a guy came over, a really, really sweet guy who just was a big fan of Sons and wanted to just come over and say hello and, and shake my hand. But, you know, sometimes when somebody 
And it happens to me too. There's somebody that you watch on TV or that you admire in some way, and you meet them. You get a little nervous. And I don't know about you guys, but sometimes my hands get a little sweaty when I'm <laughs> nervous. And this guy suffered from that same affliction. So <laughs> I, I had, you know, I had a little sweaty handshake right in the middle of uh, eating my meal. So that. <laughs> so was... then the rest of the time, you're just trying to eat with. Yeah, I was. Hand. I ate. I ate over here. <laughs> I said, "All right, I guess I'm gonna have to get a fork and, and just use this hand." Because you don't want to be rude. And then the, when the, you know, like a second he walks away, you're doing this, and he right, turns around, around and you're like, "Oh, I, hi." I yeah, was. Yeah. Uh, Sure. I was not. I didn't mean to wipe your essence off my hand. Right. What's the weirdest thing that Ev Van has said or done to you? In I got a letter a while ago from a lady in Italy, uh, and it was very, very straightforward. You sort of basic, like really like you, think you're great, would like to meet you sometime. Uh, but if that doesn't happen, is there any chance you could send me a lock of hair or one of your fingernails? <laughs> I mean, and, then she, and then she said, you may think that this sounds fetishistic, and you would be right. <laughs> so I sent her some fingernails. You, did you really? No. Oh, that'd be crazy. Amazing. No. No. So that was, uh, that was an unusual one. Do fans ever give you career advice? Because I find sometimes just being, you know, in juxtaposition of The Walking Dead, like, people will come up and they'll, like, they talk at the actors, like, how could you do that, mm-hmm. you know? Do, do people, because they, you know, people do have that kind of an ownership over, I think, over their fandoms, you know? It's like yeah, they, sure. they let the show into their homes. It's very intimate to them. They connect to it. And so they sort of watch it like it's a documentary. Right. So I do, they probably do feel some sense of ownership over you. So do people just kind of come up and go, you know what you ought to do? Yeah, that happens. <laughs> that happens. Um, I don't know why. This doesn't really answer your question. But what came into my mind when you were saying that is I went, I was doing a f- another film Um, and I was playing a guy coming out of prison, and I wanted to go and visit a prison just to sort of feel what that rhythm was like. So I got um, invited to go to Ayman Prison. So sorry, I thought you were going to say, so I got arrested. So I got arrested, yeah, sure. (laughs) No, I went and visited this prison, which is a supermax prison in Arizona called Ayman, and it's heavy, like the... Like, the vibe in there was really, really serious. And there'd just been a stabbing in this main hall right before, and so they'd cleared it out. And then we went into this giant hall, and it was like an old-school prison with, um, like, four um, tiers of, like, four levels and, like, the metal bars all the way along and everyone looking in. And the, the warden had such an enormous amount of power. And, like, these dudes were, like, serious, you know, contenders. Like, right. these were... Tough guys. Real deal, no joke. Real deal, all, like, in maximum security, serving, you know, long sentences. And we walked in, it was really rowdy, and just the energy hit us. And I was like, man, this is probably not the smartest place to be. Uh, And then this hush fell over, and fell over the whole place. And I heard one girl, like, yo, big dog, big dog's here. And they were talking about the warden. And it was just, was clear, the enormous amount of power that this guy had in that environment. And then it was all, like, very, very quiet for a second. And I just felt like there were, all of this intention was on us. And I never wanted to feel more, like, anonymous. And, and then someone screamed, Yo, Jax, where are Abel at, homie? And I realized, <laughs> oh. <laughs> all of these people know me. And so it was ended up being cool. And I walked around, had some conversations with people. But it doesn't really answer your question. But it's kind of a sweet moment. But it is, it is, it is one of those moments where, you know... Because I, and there are times when I'm sure you don't want to be recognized, you know, if you're having a bad day or if you're having, but certainly in a maximum security prison, you want people to be fans. Yeah, that's when you yeah, want that's, people that's to be where fans you want it. Yeah. We have to take a quick break. When we come back, our audience member is going to get up and ask questions of Charlie Hunnam, who is here. Also, questions from you guys at home. And if you want to be a part of the show, we're at Talking on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You're going to find exclusive updates about upcoming guests and ask questions that you have for these guests. Because no matter who we're talking to, you are part of the conversation more with Charlie Hunnam when we come back. On talking with Chris Hardwick. Welcome back to talking with Chris Hardwick. Hi, Chris Hardwick. Charlie Hunter is my guest. Now it's time to have a very nice fan from the audience get up and ask a question. Please stand up and ask your question. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? What's your name? My name is Mark. I'm from San Pedro. Wait, I'm sorry, what was it? Mark from San Pedro. Hey, Mark. What is your question? My question is for Charlie. I uh, what imagine. Ti- <laughs> <laughs> what type of sword training did you do for King Arthur? What was, and was there any mishaps? 
Um, not any hilarious or significant mishaps, and a million small knocks to the mainly on the hands, on the knuckles, you know, that cumulatively end up with a sore hand at the end of a long day of sword fighting. But um, I know people always say it, those, those whether it's um, fist fighting or sword fighting or staff fighting, for film is always much more like a dance, you know? It's like you just learn a couple of those moves, you very specifically choreographed, and then you do a couple more and you do a couple more um, and then put the whole thing together. So it's not as scary or exciting or fun as it might be. I heard that um, Russell Crowe, I mean, this is just pure gossip, but why not? Uh, <laughs> I heard that Russell Crowe on Gladiator used to go off book in terms of the choreography and would just start swinging that the sword about around. Right. Yeah, that tracks. So, uh, I don't think uh, anyone here is surprised to hear yeah, that. Yeah, no, after a while, you know, he was just, uh, he was just working with Probably even guys. when the cameras weren't even rolling. Yeah, right. He was still <laughs> yeah. swinging a sword. And even the fact that I'm saying that and making jokes about it, he's right. probably going to attack me Yeah, with you sword. better not have him on the show. Uh, you know, I have a very special gift for you. Oh, these pants and these boots. Cut that part out. All right. Mark, I have a very special gift for you. Mark, would you like to pull the sword out of the... All right. I think Whosoever I pulls this sword from I the think... stone shall henceforth be king of all England. I better oversee this. Yeah. See what my competition looks like. Mark is the king! Oh. That, you can keep that. Charlie really assigned that. Thank you very much. Well done, go. sir. Nice to, nice to see you. Oh, he just Thank said you. he didn't like shaking hands, Mark! Oh. He just said, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, I, Charlie, Mark looks... He's clean. Yeah, you yeah. don't have to worry about it. I'm not worried about he's, him. He's, he's all washed. Uh, next, we have a video message for a fan for Charlie. from a fan for Charlie. Let's take a look. Hi, my name is Amy. I'm from Hoboken, New Jersey. I'm a big Sons of Anarchy fan, and I was wondering if you're scared of ever being typecast as the tough guy. Are you scared of ever being typecast as the tough guy? I'm so lovely. <laughs> so clearly so lovely and gentle. Um, I guess not. No, I love playing tough guys, though, so I, I seem to gravitate towards those roles, but uh, I never really worry about sort of being typecast, just probably because my mom tells me how lovely I am oh, on that's such true. a yeah. regular basis. That's that, nice. Uh, yeah, You're a nice boy. Mitigates any, any fear in that department. Did you, were, you, were you a tough kid growing up, or did you, or, or do you... There were times where I had to be, but no, I mean, I was actually really scared most of the time. I, I grew up in a place where dudes loved to fight, and there was a lot of fighting um, all the time. There's a real currency in this little town that I grew up with in, in my teenage years called Penrith in the Lake District. Um, and there was... I didn't really fit in that well, or despite my best efforts initially, and then I decided fuck it, I'm not even going to try after <laughs> right, a while. Right. And was just like the weird kid in town. And so I definitely found myself in situations pretty regularly where, where there was either the threat of having to fight or I actually did have to. Sure. And I hated it, you know? And it was funny, like I... I grew up, my dad's like a su was a super, super tough dude. And I always sort of had trouble reconciling the fear that I had in the face of violence when yeah. he was a dude who had really excelled in an industry, not an Ill illegal industry, a legal industry, but that was often very um, self-policed. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a scrap man, and those guys, there's a lot of theft in that business, and because there's a lot of theft in the, the actual metal that they're trading is very valuable, it then becomes cost prohibitive to be able to insure, and so it's like one of those like legal businesses that ends up being self-policed where you have to have the reputation to back you up that people know if they mess around come steal your shit it's going to be a bad day for them right. you know and so my dad was super tough and yet i found myself so afraid all the time of having to get involved in physical altercations and it really bothered me and i felt like a little bit you know insecure and, and felt like a, a sense of self-loathing as a teenager that I wasn't as tough as my dad. And I think I sort of probably went too far in writing that and trying to figure out a way to, to mitigate or like to reduce that level of fear. And so I learned how to fight and I sort of, I think probably developed a bit of a dickhead, tough guy persona <laughs> in like my teenage years, my early twenties that 
took a while for me to catch that that I'd become something that I didn't really, that I never wanted to be. It was just a reaction to the situation that I'd found myself in, you know? So Did people, uh, how did bikers react to Jax? I mean, did people try to fight you in public? Or... <laughs> You know, bikers specifically, a lot of those dudes are so tough. It's never really the really tough guys that you've got to worry about. It's the sort of medium level tough right, guys right, right. that fancy themselves being tough but have a lot to prove. Right. Those are the dudes that you really got to watch out for. The actual, like, hardcore dudes and, like, real bikers that I interacted with a, a lot, none of them ever gave me a hard time. They understood that the show was sort of like the Pulp Fiction, like, larger-than-life right. representation of their world and that we weren't trying to actually, you know, really portray them in, like, a very, like, um, you know, just a very, like, natural, authentic way, right. you know? Yeah, so, respectfully. You know, exactly, yeah. so... We have another fan from the audience who's going to ask a question. Where are you? Oh, uh, excellent. Do you need this microphone? You probably need this. What is your name? My name's Chloe. Chloe, what's Chloe? your question? I was wondering, what's the craziest thing you've ever done? Ever. Mm, seconds <laughs> coming on this show. Um, I don't know. I try not to do that. You know what? It's funny. I was actually just about to do the craziest thing that I, uh, that I have ever done. And then it ended up falling through. But I'm going to still do it. But I was supposed to do it last week. Um, there's a friend of mine called Michael Muller who's an amazing photographer. And he photographs sharks. And he's taken to cage free diving with the sharks. He just free dives outside of the cage with great whites and everything. You know, I wasn't going with great whites, obviously, but I am um, have an abject terror of the ocean because of sharks. Um, but it's really cool. He's trying to get people that have a little bit of sort of a like uh, like public figures or people that have a little bit of recognition to go out and dive with sharks to show that it's actually fairly safe and to try to change people's perception of, of sharks. Because, you know, we kill like 100 million sharks a year and the shark populations are in real trouble, uh, you know. And it's very hard to get people excited about shark conservation because they've been through Jaws and all of the other media, um, the, the general media relationship with sharks is so vilifying that it's hard to get people to feel sympathetic for the plight. And so I had agreed um, <laughs> to go swim with uh, tiger sharks and hammerhead sharks um, cage-free. And then, um, I don't know, I still haven't gotten to the bottom of it. I suspect because I'm on a big press tour right now, that somebody at the studio thought that that wasn't a great idea because <laughs> all of a sudden this photo shoot that I was supposed to do um, didn't happen. Um, but at some point in the future when I'm not under contract, I'm going to go and uh, God, it, it's swim such, with sharks. Yeah, my, my wife wanted... My wife has been, had been dying to do it and we were in the Bahamas and she was like, well, let's go out and we'll get on a boat. And they take you... And you kind of, everyone on the boat sort of shimmies out onto this rope that's tied, tethered to the boat. And then there are sharks swimming below. And the idea is, I mean, you're talking about actually swimming with sharks. We were floating above them. And they go, well, they can't swim straight up, you know. So yeah, they, sure they yeah, can't. I know, that's what I said. I'm like, right. this, we're in their fucking living room. What are you talking about? <laughs> and I've never, exp I don't think I've ever really experienced the feeling before. And just, just, I'm just warning you ahead that you might feel... Because your body has a very visceral, uh, uh, automatic reaction to, oh, I am prey. I am now prey. <laughs> this thing can murder me in seconds. Right. And I'd never really felt anything like that before. And, and I, I immediately shimmied. Of course, my wife was like, this is the greatest. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, was shimmy, I shimmied back on the boat. I'm like, okay, this was really fun. Uh, have you been swimming with sharks? What's the craziest thing you've ever done? Oh, I don't think I can say it. So. <laughs> Good answer. I don't know. <laughs> kind of feel like you can. <laughs> um, I don't really know. There's... <laughs> no, yeah, well, no. Um, I've she's, a, a, she's asking the question. I know, right. I know, but I'm not uh, Actually, I think the craziest thing, you guys probably wouldn't consider it that, but I had a kid. Oh. Yeah. That's that is the crazy. craziest That is the thing craziest adventure life done. has to offer. Yeah. Is having so. a, have, well, then I have a very... Okay, so knowing you have a child, I have a very uh, special oh, thing for no. you, which I think this will... You, you know, your child probably needs to be protected running around, <laughs> so now your child has a helmet signed by uh, Charlie Hunnam. What is your child's name? 
That's for Riley. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, before we go to break, I want to let you guys know the uncut extended version of this will be available as a Nerdist podcast. If you go to amc.com slash talking, you can get bonus clips, exclusive content, and the links to the podcast for every one of our episodes. More with Charlie Hunnam in a moment. We'll see you in a sec. Yeah. Welcome back to Talking with Chris Hardwick. Charlie Hunnam is talking with me, Chris Hardwick. So it's time for me to turn things over again to our live studio audience. Uh, anyone else have a question in the audience they would like to ask? Hello. What is your name? Hi, I'm Nicole from Santa Clarita. Hi, nice to see you. What's hi. your question? Uh, Charlie, I just want to say hi. Love your work. Um, oh, thank you. So, you from Santa Clarita? Yes. We Do you know where that is? Sh- yeah, we shot there all the time on Suns. Yes, I know, because like- I saw you guys on Newhall Ranch Road. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. I, absolutely. Um, so- I know, I used to stalk <laughs> you in Santa Clara. <laughs> yes, I was that person back there. <laughs> um, so, fun fact, actually, my dad uh, sold his bike to the show in the first season, and it was Jax's bike. So my question was... Is that right? Yeah. Was what happened to my dad's bike? <laughs> <laughs> I've been dying. I never thought I'd be able to ask. So. It is in my garage. Is I stole it, really? it. No, it's not. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Are you serious? No, I stole it. Oh, my yeah. gosh. <laughs> uh, along with everything else I could steal at the end of that show, yeah. I figure I'd... What is your dad's name? Uh, Kevin Diggins. Oh, my God. Thank <laughs> Right on, Kevin. Well, thank you for the <laughs> Thank you for the well, bike, Kevin. I have a very special... <laughs> yes. Oh I have a very special... Uh, oh, my God. What? Oh, oh I, gosh. I'm right here. I'm right here. <laughs> <laughs> Can I come this way? <laughs> Uh, and the here, bike's around the corner, right? The bike is around the corner. Yeah, we'll get that to you. Uh, so you have a very oh special God. vest here, oh and then you have uh, this is wow. Of course, you're so welcome. Let's take another question from the audience. Uh, come on up. Come on up. What is your name? My name's Tova, and I'm from Malibu, California. Hello. Hello. Um, Charlie, will you sign this shirt for me? It's your actual shirt from Sons of Anarchy. My brother bought it for me. He's a huge prop collector, and I would love for you to sign it for me. Oh, wow. This is you a absolutely dream come true. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm dying. I'm does dying. It, does it still smell? No, no, no. It did. It used to smell really good. Oh, my God. <laughs> Do you wear this shirt a lot? Do you wear it a lot? Um, well, I didn't wear it this for a while. This was a favorite of mine. This is like was season it? three or yeah, four. It, it I used to rock this. Yeah, it says Jacks in the back. It yeah, and, and like felt tip, right? Yeah, yeah, just, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, that was, so uh, here, where should you sign? Where would you like me to sign? I'm shaking. <laughs> I don't know. Right okay, there is fine. Oh, my God. Oh, my. Thank you, God. Oh, my God. That's perfect. <laughs> Thank you, God. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's how you get out. Oh, you got a hug. My flesh. Is this your pen? Yeah, it's my pen, and I'm happily married for 20 years. My husband said, just don't embarrass me. I said, okay. All right. <laughs> it sounded like... It sounded like there was a but at the end of, I'm happily married for 20 years, but... I mean, is this, you know, the, 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 fandom, the fandom for sons is so... Uh, <laughs> I mean, the fandom, you know, all these people here, these, these young ladies sitting in the front row are like, oh, my God, we're so nervous because Charlie's right there. I mean, Sons resonated with people so, so much. And this is like, this is not ordinary fandom with Sons. It's, it's deep. Yeah. So when you look back at the series and your experience on the show, like, how do you see it? And what's your takeaway from it? I mean, that, that interaction that I have with the people that have, that have really loved the show continues, and it's wonderful. I was in Thailand last week, and a lot of people, a lot of the Thai people were coming up, and, and it has just sort of recently reached the Thai shores. It seems to be still making its rounds, and people are enjoying it, which is great. You know, I mean, we put in, I, I, I put everything I have into these projects, so it's really wonderful when some of them work. But was it hard to say goodbye to him? It was. It really was. I mean, there was a period... I'd come to love that guy. I'd lived with him in my heart and soul for eight years, you know, and gotten to know him very well. And in a weird way that sounds sort of a little, you know, airy-fairy and maybe even, like, a little pretentious, but the truth is, like, he, like, became part of me. Like, he, like, he was with me the whole time. And there were instances that happened during that period of the show that I feel like 
behaviorally, I operated differently than I would have either before or after. Um, I got burgled one night, uh, or actually got burgled twice during that period of time. And obviously the sensible thing to do is just to, you know, lock your doors and call the police. But I decided to go fight the dudes both times. <laughs> um, <It's> not advisable. <laughs> you know, one time was big, dude was big and it was three o'clock in the morning and he was in my yard, you know, and I had a 10 foot fence. So he tried pretty hard to get in there, you know, and uh, I did, you know, Jax took over and just handled the situation, <laughs> you know. And so it was, uh, it was really hard to say goodbye to him. And, you know, there were a lot of tears and, um, I found myself really sort of reluctantly letting it go. Although creatively I was ready to say goodbye to that experience and ready to move on and do different things, when it actually came to saying goodbye to Jax, it was much more um, significant and difficult than I'd anticipated. And I ended up, we shot on the, on the same um, back lot for the seven years and I got very close with the security dudes and all the people that worked around that place and I um, for about three or four nights after we'd wrapped the show I found myself getting on my bike and riding out there because I just wanted to sort of still be in that environment and sort of slowly say goodbye to Jax and the first night I showed up there the security guys were a bit surprised that I was there because the show had wrapped and there was no reason at all to be there. And I sort of bullshitted them and said I'd forgotten something on the back lawn. They said, yeah, no problem, just go on. And so I went and hung out for a little while and, you know, may or may not have smoked a joint and just like, <laughs> said, like, a farewell to Jax. And then the, the next night I showed up and they were like, you forget something? I was like, yeah, yeah, I, for, I, I forgot something else. I forgot how much uh, I miss you guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, it was, it was a process to extricate him from my heart, but, you know. Well, he'll always be with us. That's right. It was uh, funny, you know, when, when Opie, when the, the guy played uh, Opie, um, um, was written off the show when he ended up leaving, he wrote this amazing essay called The Last Rites of Opie Winston. And I never forget, there was one passage in it when he was talking, because that had really blindsided him. He didn't know that his character was going to be... He, you know, we all assumed that really it was going to be Jackson Opie, like running the show at the end of the at the end of the show, um, and uh, and so he really was having a difficult time. And he said uh, he said this amazing thing that all actors like ha- like carry around this graveyard of characters that they've had to bring to life and then kill. But with Opie, it was the first time that the son of a bitch wouldn't die. And it was, like, (laughs) in him. And, like, he just felt this presence in a way that he'd never had before. And in an act of uh, desperation, he'd found himself in a bookshop, um, like a a performing arts bookshop up on Sunset, I think. And he was looking at all these books on acting. And he said it was so interesting because there were all these books on character development and how to put a character together. And not a single chapter in any of those books how to kill the son of a bitch when you were finished, you know? It was just really interesting, and I'd seen a few people that had been on that show, because it was a very deep experience for all of us, have real trouble saying goodbye to the experience and to each other. So I knew that I was in for a rough go when, when, I, when we finally had I to mean, say goodbye I mean, it is kind of chance, like but... a breakup, in a way. Cause you're, it's kind of like a Because you're in a relationship. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah it is. It's, a, it's a, a, a bereavement, but you're in a relationship that's just you know, it's passed away. Right. I mean, it's not there anymore. And you don't, you know, I mean, you could, you, because you're you and you have your face and your body, you can go look in the mirror and go, I'm Jax. But, you know, right. but it's not, but ultimately, yeah, the, you know, I don't do that that okay, often. All right. <laughs> well, I think we all like to imagine that you do. Yeah. But, but no, but I, I did get like weird about it. I, I kept the cut, obviously. I have the cut. I kept everything. I mean, I'm such a pikey. I stole everything I could. <laughs> I had the rings and the whole get up. I, had my, I have my knife. You have her the, dad's motorcycle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've got it all. Uh, I would have taken the table, but it wouldn't fit on the back of my bike. <laughs> but um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, the cut. And then since that final scene where I took the cut off, I was very, very strict about the fact that nobody could wear it. Like, I have friends, it's like hanging in my house, and I have friends be like, oh, let me try that on. And I just decided once I took it off the final time, I was never going to put it back on. And if I wasn't going to put it back on, no one was going to no put, it, gonna back put on, it back so. on. Uh, we have another video message. Let's see, let's go to the video. Hey, this is Travis from Tacoma, Washington. And my question for Charlie is. Uh, I know you worked with Judd Apatow on Undeclared. What are some of your favorite memories working with him? 
Ah, oh, that's a nice question. Um, there really aren't any jokes. Are real dickheads. No, I'm joking. No, uh, that was great. It was, you know, the period of time when I did that show, I'd just gotten to Los Angeles. Maybe I'd been here for 18 months, but I hadn't developed a, a core group of friends. And so working with all those young guys, not, not only did I have a great time with them on the show, but they became my little family in Los Angeles. Um, Jason Siegel and Seth Rogen mm-hmm. and, and Jay Baruchel Baruch- and Tim Sharp and all these people that have gone on to have, obviously, now enormous careers. But uh, it was great. I mean, it, it was... I think doing that show and getting and making those friendships is what kept me in LA because you know it was a hard place to settle and and you know I was pretty unsure I was unsure whether I was going to make a go of it and make my life here and it's really meeting those guys that sort of cemented the deal. So do you do you ever do you, is there is comedy something that you ever think you might veer into? Again? You know I think about it sometimes. Comedy is tough and there's a lot of people out there doing it very well and my sort of my creative pull has always been to the more dramatic stuff but uh but it is very fun and i I mean i did have a great time on on that show and i've had fun when i've done comedy in the past so we'll see you know i'm i'm open to all of it whatever happened with the vlad script that you wrote do we that had many many ups and downs we had two different directors attached and wrote many many drafts of it and it was just expensive i mean like we discussed i'd wanted to tell the true story of vlad the impaler in which he was the um inspiration for bram stoker's dracula so you can fairly effortlessly weave in all of the mythology that was the man that turned into the myth without actually jumping the shark right. and making him a vampire right. but it was very difficult to justify the level of budget that we wanted to that we really needed to bring that world alive in a in a really sort of exciting and visceral way so we just we sort of we we pushed the boulder up the hill a few times it just never quite got it to the top so but it's it's still a story i'd love to tell so you know maybe if keep on you know doing well and, well, and get yeah. some get some uh, inertia built up well know, especially maybe. now you know there's like limited tv series you we've know we've had that conversation i mean it's i developed that with um jeremy kleiner at Brad, Brad, um plan b brad pitt's company mm-hmm. and so and he I, I, he actually produced also the Lost City of Zed that I did, and I have another project with him that we've been developing, and we've been talking about that, the, the potential of doing it as a limited series. It might be pretty cool. Brad Pitt's company is called Plan B. He named his company after the morning after pill. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Take a second with that. You know, when you're that handsome. <laughs> hey, come on. It's always Plan B somewhere. Am I right, guys? It's always plan B somewhere. Yeah, I think it'd be really interesting. I wonder if there was a I wonder if there was a network that we were on right now that was good with genre programming right? that might do a Vlad the Impaler show. Uh, AMC! And, uh... Yeah, I'm talking about you. Uh, we have time for one more question, I believe. One more fan question. <laughs> hey, what's your name? Hi, Gina from Los Angeles. And what's your question? Uh, what was it like shooting in the jungle for Lost City of Z? Uh, it was wonderful. I mean, it was really, really wonderful. It was, um, it's amazing to be, I mean, I obviously, I think we all live in cities, right, where most you'll see of the natural world is going to a park and seeing a tree with a couple of birds in it. So to be somewhere that was so vital and, like, filled with life. And, you know, we all, this climate change and overpopulation and everything, I think, have a tendency to get very... Uh, neurotic and upset about the state of the world and it was really reassuring and exciting to be somewhere that was so filled with life but obviously it had its downsides too because some of that life wants to kill you Um, (laughs) i had a rather unpleasant interaction with a um beetle um that burrowed its way into my ear while i was sleeping and 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 got in but you fucking kidding that's the bug oh god yeah man it got in, but then it couldn't get back out. Oh, God. It had never had to walk backwards before, and it wasn't sure And you were exactly. worried about shaking a sweaty guy's hand, and you had a <laughs> fucking beetle burrowing in your brain? Dude, so it got there, and it hit 
the uh, eardrum and it couldn't go any further and it panicked. So it just thought it would bite, it chew its oh, way through. Oh, God! So it, it bit a, a hole in my eardrum. So I woke up to this sort of pneumatic, what sounded like a pneumatic drill in my ear as it was like burrowing around, panicking. And I had one of the, we were working six days a week and it was our, our, our day off the next day and I didn't want to bother anyone. But we were in the <laughs> middle of the jungle, the middle of nowhere. So I had one of those, you know, like uh, irrigation pots, yeah. like uh, water irrigation pots, like a netty pot. Uh, and I just filled it up with water and stuck it in my ear and tried to like, you know, flush him out. And nothing came out, but he stopped moving. So I thought, all right, this is going to be okay. So I went back to bed. Went what? Back to bed. <laughs> I know. There's, there's still a beetle in your head. I work hard. I was tired. <laughs> so I went back to sleep and I woke up the next morning and it was moving around again. I said, oh, man, we're going to have to do something about this. So I called production and they called an ambulance and an ambulance came to the hotel but the uh, medic didn't speak any English. And so she brought the receptionist of the hotel with her. So she came and put the instrument in my ear and had a little look around. And then I was just like trying to make eye contact with her to, to discern what actually was happening. She didn't look to me. She looked at the receptionist from the hotel and went... <laughs> <laughs> did him the uh, the scope and then he had a look in my ear and I thought all right this is probably the point where we go to hospital because uh, this is uh, this Didn't is they, not... they pulled the beetle out yeah they had to flush it out and it was uh... did you keep it no it was a very sad <laughs> story for me and the beetle you know the ir- the pump that they used to irrigate out the ear canal is very powerful so the beetle sort of disintegrates good it. fuck that guy <laughs> fuck him <laughs> Seriously, how dare you crawl I, no, I, I your really, ear. I wanted to figure out a way to get him out alive, <laughs> but I thought maybe we could have made friends. Oh, my God. That is one of the most horrifying things I've ever... Oh, God. I'm going to have nightmares about that. I do... Chad, have... it's funny. I had a girlfriend years ago, and a moth flew into her ear. Yeah. And she, like, completely, like, completely panicked and wigged out and was literally, like, running around the living room like a mad person, screaming and slapping her ear. You're sure the moth wasn't just driving her brain? Right. She was just (laughs) staring at the light? But I had to grab her, and I grabbed her. I mean, this is, I don't know, maybe too much information. And pinned her to our bed and uh, and got some um, tweezers and pulled it out. And so I'd sort of already gone through that procedure before. Four, so that oh, okay, was, good. I was See able to like, un, you know. So I, if you ever get a bug in your ear, Charlie Hunnam's your guy. Uh, I have a present for you. So we have a bug for you. Do you, you want uh, shield or gauntlets? Uh, gauntlets. Gauntlets. All right. Here you go. Here are your. Here, put, hold your hand out. Yeah, there you go. Get that in there, and then get this in here. Great, I will take that for you. Never take those off uh, the rest of your life. Just a couple more quick things before we let you go. What's going on with Pack Rim 2? Are you, is there a Pack Rim 2? Are you doing a Pack Rim 2? There is a Pack Rim 2. I uh, was not available. I was shooting something else. And I had a very finite amount of time, sure. so I am not doing it. Okay, but, gotcha. Um, uh, well, may we'll... show up. You might just pop up. Any little appearance, we'll see. Uh, Just some rapid fire questions before we let you go. Joan Sukes on Twitter Is there an actor with whom you feel you've been chasing the same roles? Oh, wow. Yeah, through like the different stages of my career, there have been several. There was a rather annoying period of time where Justin Timberlake. Like two, maybe even three roles in a row that I had wanted. So uh, really, you better watch out, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see if you're gonna. Uh, uh, lady bonus is a reaction. Just want to see if there's any good questions. Uh, any quick questions? Oh, Wendy Mac 27. Are you interested in directing or producing in the future? Yes, I am currently already producing. I have three projects that I'm developing as a producer that are things for me to star in as an actor. And then I have a film that I've been doing a tremendous job procrastinating, actually sitting down to write, that I would like to direct myself, a tiny, tiny little independent film. Is there anything you can tell us about any of those? Um, The film that I want to direct is a little love story set against the backdrop of the gypsy community in the north of England. Cool. Great. Does it have a title? Do you have a title for it? No. All right. Up to suggestions. Uh, Up to suggestions. Call it uh, Bug in My Ear. Okay. (laughs) 
<laughs> working title. Working title, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we got that. Uh, uh, big, uh, uh, favorite movie TV shows? Yeah, that's all right. What's your, oh, you know what? I'm kind of curious. Uh, Do Real Negan on Instagram wants to know uh, what's your favorite movie? Oof, that's an impossible one. I really don't have a favorite movie. What have I been watching a lot recently? Uh, this is one of those blank things where it's basically all I think about and all I spend every second of my day doing is watching movies, and then I ask a question like this. And you don't, you can't no think answer. of what, yeah, I know. It's, it's too big um, of a, it's like going to Google and going, I can find out anything I want. Oh, what do I want to know? No, I can learn anything. You know who's the safe? Godfather 2 is always a safe one to throw out there. Yeah, good. Excellent. And then Hodges Art, the defining question, Star Wars or Star Trek? Star Wars. Star Wars, all right. There you go. Excellent. Uh... One of the things that we've kind of been doing at the end of the show is because, you know, one of the reasons why I started the podcast was just to, I just wanted to learn about people. I wanted to learn, as I sort of feel like, I, I don't really know what I'm doing. How do other people figure out what they want to do? How do other people figure, this has all just been an incredible learning experience for me. I always love to get just nuggets of wisdom from people. So I guess, is there any piece of life advice or is there some sort of guiding principle that, you know, sort of you, you take with you everywhere that keeps your head above water and keeps you sane? Like, what's something that you... I mean, you said the Thoreau quote uh, mm -hmm. earlier, uh, but is there anything else that, that you leave? I don't know if it's great advice because it's a double-edged sword. It both, it both uh, motivates me uh, and also creates an enormous amount of anxiety, but I, I think that the defining... Um, the defining obsession of my life so far has been the judicious use of time, mm -hmm. just recognizing how precious time is and trying to make the most of it every day, like wake up and, you know, and, and, and you know, we all have our responsibilities, financial and responsibilities to family, but to try to carve out as much time every day to bring forth who you want to be and what you want to do with your life. Excellent. Uh, this was amazing. Thank you so much, Charlie Hanna, for being here. King Arthur, Legend of the Sword, is in theaters May 12th. Also remember to check out At Talking on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to find out who's going to be on the show and how you can be a part of it. Uh, and when is, uh, when is the other film coming out? Do you know yet? We don't know yet. Yeah, we do know. I should know. I could, I'll, I'll get back to you. Brandon, do we know? Do we know? Can it's we find out? April, let's... April 15th? <laughs> when? Why not? You know, it, it, it comes out different places. Oh, it comes out. I, you know what? I think, that's already, I think it's already come out by the time this airs. That's what it is. Uh -huh. That it has already been out. Anyway, it, the movie did great. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank it was you. great. Well Thank done. You. Uh, Charlie you. Hunnam, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm Katana. Be nice to each other. Don't text and drive. And I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Now leaving Nerdist.com. Enjoy your burrito. Because no matter who we're talking to, you are part of the conversation. More with Charlie Hunnam when we come back on Talking with Chris Hardwick. <laughs> Welcome back to Talking with Chris Hardwick. Hi, Chris Hardwick. Charlie Hunnam is my guest. Now it's time to have a very nice fan from the audience get up and ask a question. Please stand up and ask your question. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? What's your name? My name is Mark. I'm from San Pedro. Wait, I'm sorry, what was it? Mark from San Pedro. Hey, Mark. What is your question? My question is for Charlie. I uh, what imagine. Type... <laughs> <laughs> what type of sword training did you do for King Arthur? What was... And was there any mishaps? Um, not any hilarious or significant mishaps. And a million small knocks to the, mainly on the hands, on the knuckles, you know, that cumulatively end up with a sore hand at the end of a long day of sword fighting. But um, I know people always say it. Those, those whether it's um, fist fighting or sword fighting or staff fighting for film, is always much more like a dance, you know? It's like you just learn a couple of those moves, you very specifically choreographed, and then you do a couple more and you do a couple more um, and then put the whole thing together. So it's not as scary or exciting or fun as it might be. I heard that um, Russell Crowe, I mean, this is just pure gossip, but why not? Uh, <laughs> I heard that Russell Crowe on Gladiator used to go off book in terms of the choreography and would just start swinging that the sword about around. Right. Yeah, that tracks. So, uh, <laughs> I don't think anyone here is surprised to hear that. Yeah, no, after a while, you know, he was just, uh, he was so just working with Probably even guys. when the cameras weren't even rolling. Yeah, right. He was still <laughs> yeah. Just swinging a sword. And even the fact that I'm saying that, making jokes about it, he's right. probably going to attack me yeah, with Yeah, you better not have him on the show. Uh, you know, I have a very special... 
gift for you. Ah, oh, these pants and these boots. Cut that part out. All right. Mark, I have a very special gift for you. Mark, would you like to pull the sword out of the... I better oversee this. Yeah. See what my competition looks like. Mark is the king! Uh, that, you can keep that. <laughs> Charlie that. Thank you very much. Well you done, go. sir. Nice, nice to see you. Oh, he just Thank said you. he didn't like shaking hands, Mark! Oh. He just said, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, I, Charlie, Mark looks, he's clean. Yeah, you yeah. don't have to worry about it. I'm not worried he's about him. He's, he's, he's all washed. Uh, next, we have a video message for a fan for Charlie. From a fan for Charlie, let's take a look. Hi, my name is Amy. I'm from Hoboken, New Jersey. I'm a big Sons of Anarchy fan, and I was wondering if you're scared of ever being typecast as the tough guy. Are you scared of ever being typecast as the tough guy? I'm so lovely, <laughs> so clearly so lovely and gentle. Um, I guess not. No. I love playing tough guys, though, so I, I seem to gravitate toward... Find out more about his life and career as well as his starring role in Guy Ritchie's King Arthur, Legend of the Sword. Spoiler alert, he is King Arthur. That is right, friends. Tonight, the incredible Charlie Hunnam will be talking with Chris Hardwick. <laughs> All right, we have heard from you on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, using at talking. So I'm going to read your questions, comments, some comments even showing video messages you sent in for Charlie. And folks in the studio audience, Comic-Con style, will get to stand up and ask their questions. But uh, I'm going to start the chat a little bit first. Please welcome Charlie Hunnam. Thank you for being here, Charlie. Charlie is... You were very gracious and came on the Nerdist podcast maybe, I don't remember, it was like three or four years ago. Yeah, and maybe even five. Could have been as long as five years ago. And it was one of those ones where, you know, every once in a while, one will just really resonate with people. And then for the re- forever, people are like, oh, I really love that one with, and you were one of those ones. That's people cool. re- really love the chat. Yeah, I was saying, people have brought that up to me since, too, you know. It sounds like you have a big following, and well, I do, too. You have a big so following, with yeah. So those followings met, and we made... Podcast love. Well, yes. we did make sweet podcast love. <laughs> oh, my God. Half the audience just got pregnant. For that. So, uh, but I, I think it, you know, I don't see you do a lot of long-form stuff, so I think it was mm-hmm. one of those things of like, oh, I don't really know anything about Charlie, and you had so much great stuff to talk about, and we're going to cover a lot of it tonight. But I want to start with King Arthur, uh, because I, my wife and I watched it the other night, and it's fantastic. Uh, Guy Ritchie directed King Arthur, and he, of course, is King Arthur, and it's just a really great take on it. It's epic, but it moves, and it has the kind of the Guy Ritchie filter to it. Um, but you guys shot that in the UK. Had you been back for a while? No. I'd, uh, I'd been doing Sons of Anarchy for... We shot it seven seasons but over the course of eight years, and so I had been trying to also nourish a film career at the right. same time. So I would shoot the show for six months and then try to do a film in, in my off time. And so that had been keeping me really, really busy, and I'd actually been talking to my girlfriend, really coveting, you know, going and spending a good piece of time and reconnecting with the rhythm of life in England. So my girlfriend and I had actually talked about maybe going to rent a house once the show finished and once Sun's finished and we're going to go to London, maybe get a house for six months and just see what life felt like. And then halfway through the last season of Sons, I, uh, I got King Arthur. So that took me there for seven months anyway. So oh, wow. it was great. Uh, I did that film and then I did another film called The Lost City of Z right after, right. which also um, we shot in the UK, uh, at least half of it. So I ended up being there for about 10 months. So you're from Newcastle? Yes. And although... did, you, did, you, did you get to spend time there? No, I didn't. You know, I, most of my family live down south now, and so I used to go up and visit my dad in Newcastle a lot, but, but he's not there anymore. So, um, but we, we shot up in, um, up in uh, the Highlands of Scotland. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've got it all. Uh, I would have taken the table, but it wouldn't fit on the back of my bike. <laughs> but um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, the cut. And then since that final scene where I took the cut off, I was very, very strict about the fact that nobody could wear it. Like, I have friends, like, like hanging in my house, and I have friends be like, oh, let me try that on. And I just decided, once I took it off the final time, I was never going to put it back on. And if I wasn't going to put it back on, no one was going to no put, gonna it, back put on, it back so. on. Uh, we have another video message. Let's see. Let's go to the video. Hey, this is Travis from Tacoma, Washington. And my question for Charlie is, 
Uh, I know you worked with Judd Apatow on Undeclared. What are some of your favorite memories working with him? Oh, that's a nice question. Um, there really aren't any jokes. are real dickheads. No, I'm joking. No, uh, that was great. It was, you know, the period of time when I did that show, I'd just gotten to Los Angeles. Maybe I'd been here for 18 months, but I hadn't developed a, a core group of friends. And so working with all those young guys, not, not only did I have a great time with them on the show, but they became my little family in Los Angeles. Um, Jason Siegel and Seth Rogen mm -hmm. and, and Jay Bruchel Baruch, and Tim Sharp and all these people that have gone on to have obviously now enormous careers. But uh, it was great. I mean, it, it was, I think doing that show and getting and making those friendships is what kept me in L.A. Because, you know, it was a hard place to settle and, and you know, I was pretty unsure. I was unsure whether I was going to make a go of it and make my life here. And it's really meeting those guys that sort of cemented the deal. So do you, do you, ever, do you is there, is comedy something that you ever think you might veer into? Again? You know, I think about it sometimes. Comedy's tough and there's a lot of people out there doing it very well. And my sort of, my creative pull has always been to the more dramatic stuff, but, uh, but it is very fun. And I, I mean, I did have a great time on on that show and i've had fun when i've done comedy in the past so we'll see you know i'm i'm open to all of it whatever happened with the vlad script that you wrote do we that had many many ups and downs we had two different directors attached and mo wrote many many drafts of it and it was just expensive i mean like we discussed i'd wanted to tell the true story of vlad the impaler in which he was the um, inspiration for Bram Stoker's Dracula. So you can fairly effortlessly weave in all of the mythology that was the man that turned into the myth without actually jumping the shark right. and making him a vampire. Right. But it was very difficult to justify the level of budget that we wanted to, that we really needed to bring that world alive in a, in a really sort of exciting and visceral way. So we just, we sort of, we, we, push the boulder up the hill a few times. It just never quite got it to the top. So, but it's, so I think it was mm -hmm. one of those things of like, oh, I don't really know anything about Charlie. And you had so much great stuff to talk about. And we're going to cover a lot of it tonight. But I want to start with King Arthur uh, because I, my wife and I watched it the other night and it's fantastic. Uh, Guy Ritchie directed King Arthur and he, of course, is King Arthur. And it's just a really great take on it. It's epic, but it moves and it has the kind of the Guy Ritchie filter to it. Um, but you guys shot that in the UK. Had you been back for a while? No, I'd, uh, I'd been doing Sons of Anarchy for, we shot it seven seasons but over the course of eight years. And so I had been trying to also nourish a film career at the right. same time. So I would shoot the show for six months and then try to do a film in, in my off time. And so that had been keeping me really, really busy. And I had actually been talking to my girlfriend, really coveting, you know, going and spending a good piece of time and reconnecting with the rhythm of life in England. So yeah. my girlfriend and I had actually talked about maybe going to rent a house once the show finished and uh, once Sun's finished and we were going to go to London, maybe get a house for six months and just see what life felt like. And then halfway through the last season of Sons, I, uh, I got King Arthur. So that took me there for seven months anyway. So oh, wow. it was great. Uh, I did that film and then I did another film called The Lost City of Zed right after, right. which also um, we shot in the UK, uh, at least half of it. So I ended up being there for about 10 months. So you're from Newcastle? Yes. And although. Did, did, you, did you get to spend time there? No, I didn't. You know, I, most of my family live down south now, and so I used to go up and visit my dad in Newcastle a lot, but, but he's not there anymore. So, um, but we, we shot up in, um, up in uh, the Highlands of Scotland, which okay. is an area that I spent a lot of time in my youth and one of my favorite places in the world. If you've never been up to there, I would really recommend it's, it. It's really stunning. I mean, it's just the greenest green you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. And the night sky is, it just, it's like... It's like a chandelier hanging down. There's so many stars in the sky. Right. Is that, were you going to end up there someday, you think? Maybe just move out to the highlands? I mean, every time I'm up there, I have that fantasy of just going up and, you know, disconnecting from life and yeah. living, you know, a little bit more quiet, peaceful life. But I've got a few more things I want to do before all You're of that. You're still very young. It's still, you still have plenty of time before you need to think about going away anywhere. I mean, there's rumors that you have a ranch outside of Los Angeles somewhere? Is that, yeah. is that, uh -uh. That's not, is that true? No, I got a big mouth. I was doing, um, <laughs> I was doing a lot of press 
I think for sons, at a time that I was deciding that I was going to go and buy a ranch, and okay. I put in an offer, and uh, the offer got accepted. It was actually pretty close to L.A., about an hour outside of town. And it was maybe, I think it was maybe like eight and a half, nine acres, something like that, with a bunch of chickens and some uh, donkeys that we were going to inherit and a horse and nice. an acre of um, organic vegetable garden, which basically it was just my paradise, what I've been dreaming. You sort of... Basic, like, really like you, think you're great, would like to meet you sometime. Uh, but if that doesn't happen, is there any chance you could send me a lock of hair or one of your fingernails? <laughs> oh, oh. I mean, and then, she, and then she said, you may think that this sounds fetishistic, and you would be right. <laughs> so I sent her some fingernails. Are, and, did you really? No. Oh, that'd be crazy. Amazing. No. No. <laughs> So that was uh, that was an unusual one. Do fans ever give you career advice? Because I find sometimes, just being you know in juxtaposition of The Walking Dead, like people will come up and they'll, like they talk at the actors like, how could you do that? Mm-hmm. You know, the, do do people? Because they you know people do have that kind of an ownership over I think over their fandoms. You know, it's like yeah, they sure. they let the show into their homes. It's very intimate to them. They connect to it. And so they sort of watch it like it's a documentary. Right. So I do, they probably do feel some sense of ownership over you. So do people just kind of come up and go, you know what you ought to do? Yeah, that happens. <laughs> that happens. Um, I don't know why. This doesn't really answer your question. But what came into my mind when you were saying that is I went, I was doing a f- another film um, and I was playing a guy coming out of prison. And I wanted to go and visit a prison just to sort of feel what, that rhythm was like. So I got um, invited to go to Iman prison. So sorry, I thought you were going to say, so I got arrested. So I got arrested, <laughs> yeah, sure. No, I went and visited this prison, which is a supermax prison in Arizona called Iman. And it's heavy. Like the, like, the vibe in there was really, really serious. And there'd just been a stabbing in this main hall right before, and so they cleared it out. And then we went into this giant hall, and it was like an old-school prison with... Um, like four um, tiers of like four levels and like the metal bars all the way along and everyone looking in and the the warden had such an enormous amount of power and like these dudes were like serious you know contenders like these were tough guys real deal no joke real deal all like in maximum security serving you know long sentences and we walked in it was really rowdy and just the energy hit us and I was like man this is probably not the smartest place to be uh, and then this hush fell over and fell over the whole place. And I heard one girl like, yo, big dog, big dog's here. And they were talking about the warden. And it was just it was clear the enormous amount of power that this guy had in that environment. And then it was all like very, very quiet for a second. And I just felt like there were, all of this intention was on us. And I never wanted to feel more like anonymous. And, and then someone screamed, yo, Jax, we're able at homie. And I realized... <laughs> Oh. <laughs> All of these people know me. And so it was ended up being cool, and I walked around, had some conversations with people. But cool. And then for the re- forever, people were like, I really love that one with... And you were one of those ones. That's people cool. re- really love the chat. Yeah, I was saying, people have brought that up to me since, too, you know? It sounds like you have a big following, and well, I do, too. You have a big so following, yeah. those followings met, and we made podcast love well yes. we did make sweet podcast love <laughs> oh my god half the audience just got pregnant <laughs> but i i think it you know i don't see you do a lot of long form stuff so i think it was mm-hmm. one of those things of like oh i don't really know anything about charlie and you had so much great stuff to talk about and we're going to cover a lot of it tonight but i want to start with king arthur uh because I, my wife and i watched it the other night and it's fantastic uh guy Ritchie directed king arthur and he of course is king arthur and it's just a really great take on it. It's epic, but it moves, and it has the kind of the Guy Ritchie filter to it. Um, but you guys shot that in the UK. Had you been back for a while? No. I'd, uh, I'd been doing Sons of Anarchy for... We shot it seven seasons but over the course of eight years, and so I had been trying to also nourish a film career at the right. same time. So I would shoot the show for six months and then try to do a film in, in my off time. And so that had been keeping me really, really busy, and I had actually been talking to my girlfriend, really coveting, you know, going and spending a good piece of time and reconnecting with 
the rhythm of life in England. So yeah. my girlfriend and I had actually talked about maybe going to rent a house once the show finished and uh, once Sun's finished and we were going to go to London, maybe get a house for six months and just see what life felt like. And then halfway through the last season of Sons, I uh, I got King Arthur. So that took me there for seven months anyway. So oh, wow. it was great. Uh, I did that film and then I did another film called The Lost City of Z right after, right. which also um, we shot in the UK, uh, at least half of it. So I ended up being there for about 10 months. So you're from Newcastle? Yes. And although. Did, did, you, did you get to spend time there? No, I didn't. You know, I, most of my family live down south now, and so I used to go up and visit my dad in Newcastle a lot, but, but he's not there anymore. So, um, but we, we shot up in, um, up in uh, the Highlands of Scotland, which okay. is an area that I spent a lot of time in my youth and one of my favorite places in the world. If you've never been up to there, I would really recommend it's, it. It's really stunning. I mean, it's just the greenest green you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. And the night sky is, it just, it's like... It's like a chandelier hanging down. There's so many stars in the sky. Right. Is that, were you going to end up there someday, you think, maybe? Just move out to the highlands? I mean, every time I'm up there, I have that fantasy of just going up and, you know, disconnecting from life and yeah. living, you know, a little bit more quiet, peaceful life. But i got a few more things I want to do before all of You're that. You're still very young. It's still, you still have plenty of time before you need to think about going away anywhere. I mean, there's rumors... That you have a ranch outside of Los Angeles somewhere? Is that, yeah. is that, uh-uh. that's not, is that true? No, I got a big mouth. I was doing, um, <laughs> I was doing a lot of... Who's this sword from I the think... stone shall henceforth be king of all England? I better oversee this. Yeah. See what my competition looks like. Mark oh. is the king! Uh-huh. That, you can keep that. <laughs> Sign that. Thank you very much. Well you done, go. sir. Nice to, nice to see you. Oh, he just Thank said you. he didn't like shaking hands, Mark. Oh. He just said, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, I, Charlie Mark looks, he's clean. Yeah, you don't yeah. have to worry about I'm it. I'm not worried he's about him. He's, he's all washed. Uh, next, we have a video message for a fan for Charlie, from a fan for Charlie. Let's take a look. Hi, my name is Amy. I'm from Hoboken, New Jersey. I'm a big Sons of Anarchy fan, and I was wondering if you're scared of ever being typecast as the tough guy. Are you scared of ever being typecast as the tough guy? I'm so lovely. <laughs> so clearly so lovely and gentle. Um, I guess not. No, I love playing tough guys, though, so I, I seem to gravitate towards those roles, but uh, I never really worry about sort of being typecast, just probably because my mom tells me how lovely I am oh, on that's such true. a yeah. regular basis. That's that, nice. Uh, yeah, You're a nice boy. Mitigates any, any fear in that department. Did you, were, were you a tough kid growing up, or did you, or, or do you... There were times where I had to be, but no, I mean, I was actually really scared most of the time. I, I grew up in a place where dudes loved to fight, and there was a lot of fighting um, all the time. There's a real currency in this little town that I grew up with in, in my teenage years called Penrith in the Lake District. Um, and there was... I didn't really fit in that well, or despite my best efforts initially, and then I decided fuck it, I'm not even going to try after <laughs> right, a while. Right. And was just like the weird kid in town. And so I definitely found myself in situations pretty regularly where, where there was either the threat of having to fight or I actually did have to. Sure. And I hated it, you know? And it was funny, like I... I grew up, my dad's like a su- was a super, super tough dude. And I always sort of had trouble reconciling the fear that I had in the face of violence when yeah. he was a dude who had really excelled in an industry, not an illegal industry, a legal industry, but that was often very um, self-policed. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a scrap man, and those guys, there's a lot of theft in that business, and because there's a lot of theft in the the actual metal that they're trading is very valuable. It then becomes cost prohibitive to be able to insure. And so it's like one of those like legal businesses that ends up being self-policed where you have to have the reputation to back you up that people know if they mess around, come steal your shit, it's going to be a bad day for them, right. you know? And so my dad was super tough, and yet I found myself so afraid all the time of having to get involved in physical altercations, and it really bothered me, and I felt like understanding how vilified you can be for, like, for surrendering a, a, a specific identity and sure. taking another one on, because I had moved to, um, from Newcastle to the Lake District, which is a two very, very different dialects, 
Heights at a time when I was impressionable, young, and just wanted to fit in. I moved, and I think I was about 13. It was very difficult to move, you know, 200 miles to go to a new school and a whole new friends and everything at that age. So one of the things that I think I did was one of the ways I tried to fit in was by uh, assimilating that accent. Oh, wow. And, and, and then going home immediately, like six months later, and all my old pals being like, oh, you're fucking talking different now, aren't you? <laughs> like, you're too good for us. And like, was like, wow, people are really passionate about their regional identity. Yeah, yeah, there's now, a tremendous amount of... There is a tremendous amount of tribalism yeah. in, in a very small area, it seems like. Yeah. Because in America, I think we sort of... We kind of understand, like, well, America's very large, so, you know, the Midwest is this, and South is this, and Texas is its own thing, and then New York is this. Uh, but there, I mean, you know, you have a landmass about the size of California, but with that much specific subset genre cultural diversity. Right. So do you feel like that helped you in this business at all, in the assimilation process? Does that help you as an actor? I think so. I mean, it, it, would, it would seem so, right? Yeah. Um, like on the surface, just that like, thing of being able to you know, pick up accents and, and, and all of that. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm sure it did. I'm sure it did. It certainly made me fearless about coming out here when I was 18 alone. I mean, right. I, didn't know anybody when I came to LA. I just I was at college um, studying film and got an opportunity to start working as an actor. So I took this role in Queer as Folk that you had mentioned. Uh, and then once I finished that, I was sort of at a crossroads. I could go back to film school, but I realized I'd been at film school for about a year and realized I'd learned more on my first day on a real set than I had in, in 12 months of academic um, you know, research of right. what filmmaking is. And so the practical application. And so I, I didn't know what to do, though. I finished uh, this, this TV show and was really literally about to go back and move back in with my mom and continue going to college. And I got a call from someone saying they'd seen the show, um, a manager from Los Angeles that they'd seen the show and thought that I was good and, and wondered if I would like representation and like to come out here and, you know, go seek my fortune. So... I just came out at 18 by myself and, um, you know, I think had I not had that experience of having to completely reinvent myself and start over in my mid-teens, it might have been a bit more daunting to do that. I mean, I don't, I, we don't know each other that well, but I just have a sense that, I don't know, do you feel as confident as it seems you are? Like, it just seems like Charlie's... And they take you and you kind of, everyone on the boat sort of shimmies out onto this rope that's tied tethered to the boat and then... There are sharks swimming below, and the idea is... I mean, you're talking about actually swimming with sharks. We were floating above them, and they go, well, they can't swim straight up, you know, so they... Yeah, sure yeah they I know, that's what I said. I'm like, this, we're in their fucking living room. What are you talking about? <laughs> and I've never... Exp I don't think I've ever really experienced the feeling before, and just, ju I'm just warning you ahead that you might feel... Because your body has a very visceral, uh, uh, automatic reaction to... Oh, I am prey. I am now prey. <laughs> this thing can murder me in seconds. Right. And I'd never really felt anything like that before. And, and I, I immediately shimmied. Of course, my wife was like, this is the greatest. And I'm like, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, was shimmy, I shimmied back on the boat. I'm like, okay, this was really fun. Uh, have you been swimming with sharks? What's the craziest thing you've ever done? Oh, I don't think I can say it. So. <laughs> Good answer. I don't know. <laughs> kind of feel like you can. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, well, no. Um, I've she's, had a, she's asking the question. I know, right. I know, but I'm not I sure Actually, enough. I think the craziest thing, you guys probably wouldn't consider it that, but I had a kid. Oh. Yeah. That's that is the crazy. craziest That is the craziest adventure life done. has to offer. Yeah, is having so. a, have, well, then I have a very, okay, so knowing you have a child, I have a very uh, special oh, thing no. for you, which I think this will... You, you know, your child probably needs to be protected running around, <laughs> so now your child has a helmet signed by uh, Charlie Hunnam. What is your child's name? Riley. That's for Riley. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, before we go to break, I want to let you guys know the uncut extended version of this will be available as a Nerdist podcast. If you go to amc.com slash talking, you can get bonus clips, exclusive content, and links to the podcast for every one of our episodes. More with Charlie Hunnam in a moment. We'll see you in a sec. Yeah. Welcome back to Talking with Chris Hardwick. 
Charlie Hunnam is talking with me, Chris Hardwick. So it's time for me to turn things over again to our live studio audience. Uh, anyone else have a question in the audience they would like to ask? Hello. What is your name? Hi, I'm Nicole from Santa Clarita. Hi, nice to see you. What's hi. your question? Uh, Charlie, I just want to say hi. Love your work. Oh, um, thank you. So, you from Santa Clarita? Yes. We Do you know where that is? Yeah, we shot there all the time on Suns. Yes, I know, because like, I saw you guys on Newhall Ranch Road. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. I, absolutely. Um, I so, know, I used to stalk <laughs> you in Santa Clara. Yes, I was that person back there. <laughs> um, so, fun fact, actually, my dad uh, sold his bike to the show in the first season, and it was Jax's bike. So my question was... Is that right? Yeah. Was what happened to my dad's bike? <laughs> <laughs> I've been dying. I never thought I'd be able to ask. So. It is. Chloe, what's your Chloe? question? I was wondering, what's the craziest thing you've ever done? Ever. Mm, seconds <laughs> coming on this show. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I try not to do that... You know what? It's funny. I was actually just about to do the craziest thing that I uh, that I have ever done, and then it ended up falling through. But I'm going to still do it. But I was supposed to do it last week. Um, there's a friend of mine called Michael Muller, who's an amazing photographer, and he photographs sharks. And he's taken to cage free diving with the sharks. He just free dives outside of the cage with great whites and everything. You know, I wasn't going with great whites, obviously, but I am um, have an abject terror of the ocean because of sharks um but it's really cool he's trying to get people that have a little bit of sort of a like uh like public figures or people that have a little bit of recognition to go out and dive with sharks to show that it's actually fairly safe and to try to change people's perception of of sharks because you know we kill like a hundred million sharks a year and the shark populations are in real trouble and you know and it's very hard to get people excited about shark conservation because they've been through jaws and all of the other media um the the general media relationship with sharks is so vilifying that it's hard to get people to feel sympathetic for the plight and so I had agreed um, <laughs> to go swim with uh, tiger sharks and hammerhead sharks um, cage-free. And then, um, I don't know, I still haven't gone to the bottom of it. I suspect, because I'm on a big press tour right now, that somebody at the studio thought that that wasn't a great idea because <laughs> all of a sudden this photo shoot that I was supposed to do um, didn't happen. Um, but... At some point in the future, when I'm not under contract, I'm going to go and uh, God, it is, it's swim such, with sharks. Yeah, my, my wife wanted, my wife has been had been dying to do it, and we were in the Bahamas, and she was like, "Well, let's go out and we'll get on a boat." And they take you, and you kind of everyone on the boat sort of shimmies out onto this rope that's tied tethered to the boat, and then there are sharks swimming below. And the idea is, I mean, you're talking about actually swimming with sharks. We were floating above them. And they go, well, they can't swim straight up, you know. So yeah, they, sure they yeah I know, that's what I said. I'm like, this, we're in their fucking living room. What are you talking about? <laughs> and I've never, exp- I don't think I've ever really experienced the feeling before. And just, just, I'm just warning you ahead that you might feel, because your body has a very visceral, uh, uh, automatic reaction to, oh, I am prey. I am now prey. This thing can murder me in seconds. Right. And I'd never really felt anything like that before. And, and I, I immediately shimmied. Of course, my wife was like, this is the greatest. And I'm like, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I, was shimmy, I shimmied back on the boat. I'm like, okay, this was really fun. Uh, uh, coal mining, a lot of factory work. And then towards the middle of the century, a lot of those industries dried up and the area fell into a period of economic decline. And so when I was growing up there, it was pretty poor. And people were really just going through the motions, trying to survive. And I felt like I was just a weird kid and, you know, (laughs) growing into a pretty weird adult. Um, But (laughs) it's a true story. Uh, (laughs) But I just remember one of my earliest and most powerful sort of like original thoughts that I had. There's something that hadn't come across, you know, from my, you know, conversations I'd overheard with teachers or or parents or anything. I, I, I started to get sort of fixated with this idea that people weren't. They were, they were just engaged in the rhythm of life, whether it was like social or environmental responsibilities, being parents or husbands or wives or, you know, that 
that life itself was dictating the rhythm of their life. And they, there was a lot of people I felt like sort of stuck in that and weren't able to bring forth their intention for what they wanted their life to be. Right. And I mean, I'm talking young. I was thinking about this at f- five and six, you know, oh, wow. just sort of aware that people weren't really happy. And I decided... Then it sort of begged the question, like, what do I want to do with my life and what is my intention? And I was always really, really involved, uh, you know, interested in film and involved myself in sort of amateur performing arts and stuff. And so that just became this fixation for me from a very young age that I wanted to get out of that part of the world and go and spend my life working in film. Did you tell your parents this? Were they supportive? I did. I mean, I did. I was always very vocal about it. I remember it actually sort of felt like full circle when I got King Arthur because Excalibur, John Borman's film Excalibur, was a very instrumental and important film in my childhood. And I'd watch it over and over again. I remember having conversations with my mom, and it's probably maybe six, seven, eight, something like that, and asking her what, what are the logistics of filmmaking in terms of... I was watching these people, you know, doing this heroic stuff, sword fighting and riding horses and, you know, kissing the pretty girl at the end of the film and all of that. And I said, I was like, interested in how that would come together. So I asked my mom, what do they do? Do they go out and look for an actor that knows how, that has that skill set, that knows how to sword fight, knows how to ride horses and kiss pretty girls? And she <laughs> said, um, no, I don't think so. I think you probably, like, hire somebody who has the spirit and the, you know, the, the look and the energy of, of, of what they're looking for in that character and then teach them those skills. Uh-huh. And obviously, as a seven-year-old kid, that just blew my mind that you could <laughs> be your job learning how to sword fight and ride horses and stuff. So that was... Um, it was. It felt that, nice. Uh, yeah, you're a nice boy. Mitigates any any fear in that department. Did you were you, were you a tough kid growing up, or did you or, or do? You... There were times where I had to be, but no. I mean, I was actually really scared most of the time. I, I grew up in a place where dudes loved to fight, and there was a lot of fighting um, all the time. It was a real currency in this little town that I grew up with in in my teenage years, called Penrith in the Lake District, um, and there was. I didn't really fit in that well, or despite my best efforts initially. And then I decided, fuck it, I'm not even going to try after <laughs> right, a while. Right. And was just like the weird kid in town. And so I definitely found myself in situations pretty regularly where, where there was either the threat of having to fight or I actually did have to. Sure. And I hated it, you know? And it was funny, like I... I grew up, my dad's like a su- was a super, super tough dude. And I always sort of had trouble reconciling the fear that I had in the face of violence when yeah. he was a dude who had really excelled in an industry, not an illegal industry, a legal industry, but that was often very um, self-policed. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a scrap man, and those guys, there's a lot of theft in that business, and because there's a lot of theft in the the actual metal that they're trading is very valuable. It then becomes cost prohibitive to be able to insure. And so it's like one of those like legal businesses that ends up being self-policed where you have to have the reputation to back you up that people know if they mess around, come steal your shit, it's going to be a bad day for them, right. you know? And so my dad was super tough, and yet I found myself so afraid all the time of having to get involved in physical altercations, and it really bothered me, and I felt, like, a little bit, you know, insecure and, and felt, like, a, a sense of self-loathing as a teenager that I wasn't as tough as my dad, and I think I sort of probably went too far in writing that and trying to figure out a way to to mitigate or like to reduce that level of fear and so i learned how to fight and i sort of i think probably developed a bit of a dickhead tough guy persona <laughs> in like my teenage years my early 20s that took a while for me to catch that that i'd become something that i didn't really that i never wanted to be it was just a reaction to the situation that i'd found myself in you know so did people uh how did bikers react to Jack's? I mean, did people try to fight you in public? Or? 
You know, bikers specifically, a lot of those dudes are so tough. It's never really the really tough guys that you've got to worry about. It's the sort of medium level tough right, guys. Right, right, right. That fancy themselves being tough but have a lot to prove. Right. Those are the dudes that you really got to watch out for. The actual, like, hardcore dudes and, like, real bikers that I interacted with a, a lot, none of them ever gave me a hard time. Circling around but it the all, same it idea. All, it, all, it all makes sense uh, because it, it does help explain... I mean, again, you know, everyone runs off in a million different directions. Oh, my God, I'm, you know, if you're auditioning, oh, I want this person to like me and this person, oh, they didn't lie, oh, no, I got so close, you know, mm-hmm. or whatever it is that, that, that people are pursuing. And there really is, you know, like when you just kind of let all that crap go and just go, well, what do I want? You know, what makes me, what makes me happy, which is a question I think a lot of people don't really even know how to answer or even bother asking themselves. Yeah. But I think it is one of the single most important questions to be able to answer as a human. Right. Uh, and people just don't take the time to do it. And I've always been impressed with, because it really, it seems like you just work on stuff that you're interested in and cool stuff. And then when the whole Fifty Shades thing happened and they cash in Fifty Shades, like, oh, you know, Charlie's a good guy. That's going to be a big franchise. And then it all kind of went away. And then I, I I don't know I had a lot of re- I had a lot of respect for I don't know it just like to kind of walk away from something like that that you knew was probably going to be a commercial success but yeah. maybe just didn't feel right to you is that how it went down or what was the I mean with that specifically uh, there were many moving elements to that um, I was I got myself in a position because I was emotionally in a bit of a wrought place that had a big thing happen in my life, my personal life, and it had thrown me for a spiral, you know? Um, And so I... Well, I don't think I was thinking clearly, and I was in a great position in my career where for the first time I was getting offered tons of interesting stuff, and I've always... I've always felt very strongly just do one thing at a time and do it to the best of your ability. Um, and, and But then all of a sudden, in the face of all of this opportunity that was coming my way, it was a little harder to practice what I was preaching. Sure. And I just took on too much and felt like not only... It takes an enormous amount of focus and energy to make a movie and be a significant part of that process. And I felt like everybody needs to give it their all to make sure this this collective you know, process bears the fruits that you, ha- you, you would hope it to. And I just felt like I was spreading myself too thin. Um, and I'd already given my words to Guillermo del Toro, who, who was a friend of mine I'd worked with before, that I would star in this other movie. And that had been, that had preceded um, um, the sun, I mean, the um, Fifty Shades. So it was very, uh, it was really quite unfortunate and quite stressful um, because... I accepted the role, and they publicized it to um, you know pretty pretty um, you know pretty robustly, and then <laughs> all of a sudden uh, I realized that I wasn't going to be able to do it. So <laughs> just um, kidding, <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> so it was uh, it was a rather stressful period of my life, but um, you live and learn, as they say. Yeah, but I think it is. Mark. Oh. He just said yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know, I, Charlie Mark looks... He's clean. Yeah, you don't yeah. have to worry about it. I'm not worried he's, about him. He's, he's all washed. Uh, next, we have a video message for a fan for Charlie. from a fan for Charlie. Let's take a look. Hi, my name is Amy. I'm from Hoboken, New Jersey. I'm a big Sons of Anarchy fan, and I was wondering if you're scared of ever being typecast as the tough guy. Are you scared of ever being typecast as the tough guy? I'm so lovely. <laughs> so clearly so lovely and gentle. Um, I guess not. No, I love playing tough guys, though, so I, I seem to gravitate towards those roles, but uh, I never really worry about sort of being typecast, just probably because my mom tells me how lovely I am oh, on that's such good. a yeah. regular basis. That's that, nice. Uh, yeah, You're a nice boy. Mitigates any, any fear in that department. Did you, were, were you a tough kid growing up, or did you... Or, or do you... There were times where I had to be, but no, I mean, I was actually really scared most of the time. I I grew up in a place where dudes loved to fight, and there was a lot of fighting um, all the time. It was a real currency in this little town that I grew up with in in my teenage years called Penrith in the Lake District. Um, And there was... I didn't really fit in that well, despite my best efforts initially, and then I decided... Fuck it, I'm not even going to try after <laughs> right, a while. Right. And was just like the weird kid in town. And so I definitely found myself in situations pretty regularly where, where 
there was either the threat of having to fight or I actually did have to. Sure. And I hated it, you know? And it was funny, like, I... I grew up, my dad's like a su- was a super, super tough dude. And I always sort of had trouble reconciling the fear that I had in the face of violence when yeah. he was a dude who had really excelled in an industry, not an Ill- illegal industry, a legal industry, but that was often very um, self-policed. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was a scrap man and those guys, there's a lot of theft in that business. And because there's a lot of theft in the the actual metal that they're trading is very valuable. It then becomes cost prohibitive to be able to insure. And so it's like one of those like legal businesses that ends up being self-policed where you have to have the reputation to back you up that people know if they mess around, come steal your shit, it's going to be a bad day for them, you know? And so my dad was super tough, and yet I found myself so afraid all the time of having to get involved in physical altercations, and it really bothered me, and I felt like a little bit, you know, insecure and and felt like a a sense of self-loathing as a teenager that I wasn't as tough as my dad, and I think I sort of probably went too far in writing that and trying to figure out a way to to mitigate Beatles sort of disintegrate. Good, fuck that guy. <laughs> fuck him. I Seriously, bad, how dare you crawl no, I, I really, here. I wanted to figure out a way to get him out alive, <laughs> but I thought maybe we could have made friends. Oh, my God. That is one of the most horrifying things I've ever... Oh, God. I'm going to have nightmares about that. I do... Have, you know it's funny. I had a girlfriend years ago, and a moth flew into her ear. Yeah. And she like completely, like completely panicked and wigged out, and was literally like running around the living room, like a mad person, screaming and slapping her ear. You sure the moth wasn't just driving her brain? Right. <laughs> right. <She was> just <laughs> staring at the light. But I had to grab her, and I grabbed her. I mean, this is. I don't know, maybe too much information, and pinned her to our bed and, uh, and got some um, tweezers and pulled it out. Oh. And so I'd sort of already gone through that procedure before, so that oh, okay, was, good. I was so able to, like, un, you know... So I, if you ever get a bug in your ear, Charlie Hunnam's your guy. Uh, I have a present for you. So we have a bug for you. Do you, you want a shield or gauntlets? Uh, gauntlets. Gauntlets. All right. Here you go. Here are your... Here, put, hold your hand out. Yeah, there you go. Get that in there. And then get this in here. Great, I will take that for you. Never take those off. Uh, the rest of your life. Just a couple more quick things before we let you go. What's going on with Pack Rim 2? Are you, is there a Pack Rim 2? Are you doing a Pack Rim 2? There is a Pack Rim 2. I uh, was not available. I was shooting something else. Got and it. I had a very finite amount of time, sure. so I am not doing it. Okay, but, gotcha. Um, uh, well, may we'll, show up. You might just pop up. Any little appearance, we'll see. Uh, just some rapid-fire questions before we let you go. Joan Sooks on Twitter, is there an actor with whom you feel you've been chasing the same roles? Oh, wow. Yeah, through, like, the different stages of my career, there have been several. There was a rather annoying period of time where Justin Timberlake... <laughs> Like two, maybe even three roles in a row that I had wanted. So um, really, you better watch out, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see if you're gonna. Uh, lady bonus, it's a reaction. Just want to see if there's any good questions. Uh, any quick questions? Oh, Wendy Mac twenty seven. Are you interested in directing or producing in the future? Yes, I am currently already producing. I have three projects that I'm developing as a producer that are things for me to star in as an actor. And then I have a film that I've been doing a tremendous job procrastinating, actually sitting down to write, that I would like to direct myself, a tiny, tiny little independent film. Is there anything you can tell us about any of those? Um, The film that I want to direct is a little love story set against the backdrop of the gypsy community in the north of England. Cool. Great. So, Does it have a title? No, after a while, you know, he was just, uh, he was just working with Probably even guys. when the cameras weren't even rolling. Yeah, right. He was still <laughs> yeah. Just swinging a sword. And even the fact that I'm saying that and making jokes about it, he's right. probably going to attack me yeah, with a sword. Yeah, you better not have him on the show. Uh, you know, I have a very special gift for you. Oh, these pants and these boots. Cut that part out. All right. Mark, I have a very special gift for you. Mark, would you like to pull the sword out of the... All right. 
Yeah. Whosoever I pulls this sword from I the think... stone shall henceforth be king of all England. I better oversee this. Yeah. See what my competition looks like. Mark oh. is the king! Uh -huh. <laughs> that, you did that. <laughs> Sign that. Thank you very much. Well you done, go. sir. Nice is nice to see you. Oh, he just Thank said you. he didn't like shaking hands, Mark. Oh. He just said yes, yes, yes. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> you know, I, Charlie Mark looks he's clean. Yeah, you yeah. don't have to worry about I'm it. I'm not worried he's about him. He's, he's all washed. Uh, next, we have a video message for a fan for Charlie. From a fan for Charlie, let's take a look. Hi, my name is Amy. I'm from Hoboken, New Jersey. I'm a big Sons of Anarchy fan, and I was wondering if you're scared of ever being typecast as the tough guy. Are you scared of ever being typecast as the tough guy? I'm so lovely. <laughs> so clearly so lovely and gentle. Um, I guess not. No. I love playing tough guys, though, so I, I seem to gravitate towards those roles, but uh, I never really worry about sort of being typecast, just probably because my mom tells me how lovely I am oh, on that's such good. a yeah. regular basis. That's that, nice. Uh, yeah, You're a nice boy. Mitigates any, any fear in that department. Did you, were, were you a tough kid growing up, or did you, or, or do you... There were times where I had to be, but no, I mean, I was actually really scared most of the time. I, I grew up in a place where dudes loved to fight, and there was a lot of fighting um, all the time. There's a real currency in this little town that I grew up with in, in my teenage years called Penrith in the Lake District. Um, and there was... I didn't really fit in that well, or despite my best efforts initially, and then I decided... Fuck it, I'm not even going to try after <laughs> right, a while. Right. And was just like the weird kid in town. And so I definitely found myself in situations pretty regularly where, where there was either the threat of having to fight or I actually did have to. Sure. And I hated it, you know? And it was funny, like I, I grew up, my dad's like a su was a super, super tough dude. And I always sort of had trouble reconciling the fear that I had in the face of violence when yeah. he was a dude who had really excelled in an industry, not an Ill illegal industry, a legal industry, but that was often very um, self-policed. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a scrap man 